Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Comic Source Comic Boom collaboration. This is your DC Spotlight for the week of October 25th, 2022. We've got about 14 or 15 single books we're going to talk about that are coming out this week from DC. Uh, if you're curious about our thoughts on DC's Black Adam, of course, we've both gone to see it. Um, we both enjoyed it. Go check out the episode on Rocky's channel. Uh, we also had a, an unboxing on Friday of some books I let pile up for like two years of stuff I'd order on eBay and various places that we uh, we had some drinks and had some fun talking about why I bought 14 copies of the same book. So go check that out as well. Uh, yeah, Black Adam did well. I think I saw 147 million worldwide and it's not even open everywhere yet. So yeah, no, uh, I was happy with that. I, I wanted it to hit 70 million myself, but 67 million domestic is not, not too bad. So uh, I just hope it, I hope it has legs like Aquaman did and doesn't have it. Uh, hopefully the second week, uh, the standard second week, uh, drop off isn't isn't uh, above fifty or sixty percent. We should be okay. Huh? Well, I'm going to do my part. I think I'm going to try to go see it one more time in yeah. in the theaters. Yeah, so. me too. Well, you've seen it twice already. I've only seen it once. Yeah. So yeah. But yeah, I, 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 I think I want to make it a, a triple and go see it. <laughs> go see it one more time. So yeah. Uh, anyway, like I said, it's a pretty heavy week, so we're going to go ahead and dive right in. Um, in okay week, uh, it wasn't huge, uh, but it was solid. But uh, we'll start with the, that first book that Rocky has up there now. We talked briefly about the first issue of this, and it does tie in with, I guess, a, a podcast um, that that there is that that's uh, basically Batman Audio Adventures. It, it's sort of a takeoff on those old school um, radio serials. So it's written by Dennis McNichols, who's not a writer I'm familiar with. Anthony Marquez does the pencils, J-Bone on inks. Dave Stewart on colors, Farron Delgado on letters. I I haven't read this. I didn't read the first one, didn't read the second one. Maybe it's just a, a little yeah. too much Batman for me, but uh, but you read it, Rocky, so give yeah. us your thoughts. I'll, I'll give a quick synopsis here. It's it's not that long. Uh, first of all, I, I'm a big fan of Jay Bone. Uh, he's a, he's the inker on this one, and he does a good job inking Anthony Marquis' uh, art as penciling. And uh, this is uh, essentially, it reminds me, it's a Batman animated story. It feels like that, has the same sort of feel. This is essentially a Ra's al Ghul story. What really is Ra's al Ghul? And it involves Batman. Uh, there's this group of, uh, they look like demon hunters. And they, they look like they could, they almost look like they could be uh, a League of Assassins. But they, they look like demons. And they, they actually confront Batman because they want Batman's help to taking, to, uh, to uh, essentially find Ra's al Ghul. Uh, and they, they're looking for a demon sword. And there's a language barrier. They're not very good at speaking English. And the sort of the, the central conceit of the story is that they're, when Batman finally figures out what they want and they're asking for his help, they want the demon sword because they want to kill Ra's al Ghul. And that's the big reveal at the end. In the meantime, there's other stories interspersed with it. Killer Croc is having hallucinations uh, under uh, under Gotham and uh, they, he needs to be found. And there's there's uh, and Penguin is stealing some... Uh, is, is stealing in, in the museum, stealing a frozen woolly mammoth. And the penguin wants something, but we're not sure what it is. And this is actually weaving a tale. I don't actually know where, how all these disparate plot points are intersecting. But it's what I, what I want to give a credit to Dennis uh, McNicholas, the writer for. It, he's, uh, I'm curious, he's got my curiosity. And this, this, has, this is exactly the type of story that I would expect if I was, if I was, watching a, a DC animated uh, cartoon. He's clearly weaving a plot here that's good. It's intricate. And I just want to give him a, a shout out here because these are the types of, a lot of the writers that they end up on these on these particular titles, they will sometimes find themselves writing mainstream DC titles. And this is a, a pretty good, I'm not familiar with uh, Dennis Mc, McNicholas, uh, but I actually th think that this is a, how, uh, uh, hopefully he can weave in these plot lines well. Because, um, uh, well, hopefully he can nail the landing here. But I'm not sure how long this story arc is. But it's it might be worth for some people to to check out. Yeah, I mean, I think if you're in that aesthetic, if you you want some continuity free Batman, you know, you're a fan of Batman the animated series or old school style, you know, radio programs. Yeah, this might scratch a niche for you. Yeah. Uh, all right, moving on. Next book we're going to talk about is DC Horror Presents Sergeant Rock versus the Army of Dead, number two. This is written by Bruce Campbell. Yep, the actor, Bruce Campbell. Uh, Eduardo Riso is the artist. Christian Rossi does the colors. Rob Lee on letters. 
Uh, there's some pretty cool covers, Gary Frank cover, Francisco Francavia cover, and then a, a Kyle Hotz cover, which, man, it's, it's tough to choose between the Kyle Hotz and the Gary Frank. I'd probably go with the Gary Frank just because the Kyle Hotz is a, is a variant, 1 in 25, so it'd probably be a little more expensive. I'm a big uh, Frank Avila fan. I'm a big, so I'll disagree with uh, you. So you're going with that. Yeah, and that's not a bad cover. <laughs> yeah, it's not a bad cover either when you're yeah. talking about zombies, you know, yeah. which we mentioned the, the last time. It's World War II. Hitler has some kind of a zombie engine that he's running to help solve the problem of, uh, of attrition for his forces and Sergeant rock and easy company are trying to, to find out how they're bringing these soldiers back from the dead and put a stop to it. So I, I kind of nitpicked the first issue a little bit saying that, yeah, the word zombie didn't even exist back then. Um, but that's fine. I mean, this, this is a lot of fun. Um, the, uh, the art by Eduardo Riso really does a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the sequential storytelling, especially in early on, we get a scene in the bar where these soldiers, even though they're undead, they're still acting like soldiers and uh, maybe to an even greater degree in terms of shooting each other and whatever, because they're not going to die, right? As opposed to just your typical bar brawl, but apparently they still have a sense of humor about it because they're all laughing uh, about being able to shoot each other and, and not die. Um, which is kind of fun, but uh, it, it does have a good, solid feel of a, an easy company story, a Sergeant Rock story, which isn't a big surprise because uh, Bruce Campbell is a big Sergeant Rock fan and grew up reading Sergeant Rock comics. So this is a lot, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, I've talked before about um, last time about the Eduardo Riso art. I'm just not a huge fan of his aesthetic, but like I said, the you, you can't argue with this, his, his storytelling chops. Um, and I'm sure by the end of the series, I will, uh, it'll be one of those things where I can't imagine anyone else having done it except for Riso. So, uh, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, well, last issue ended with, uh, the, the, the doctor of Adolf Hitler, uh, obviously looking after Adolf Hitler and it's, it was strongly implied. And well, in fact, it was pretty much shown that Hitler himself is a zombie as well. He's sort of like the King zombie and <clears throat> the Sergeant, uh, Sergeant Rock and Easy Company, of course, they're tasked uh, uh, with uh, essentially attacking the fort or taking out the fort uh, where these zombies are essentially being made. And they, they come across this fort and, the, and of course, they get some major clues because they come across this bar that, as you aptly pointed out, are a bunch of zombies. Even as zombies, soldiers are soldiers and they do crazy things and are uh, trying to kill each other and they can't die. And But Sergeant Rock and Company... This is them discovering as they essentially attack this hideout that in this industrial complex, they attack these zombies. And uh, of course, they, they use a lot of the high tech equipment, high tech for World War Two to try to take some of these zombies out. And we discovered uh, the they discovered that Dr. Morrell, the actual doctor of Adolf Hitler, is actually on the premises. And it was actually uh, kind of an interesting scene. There was one scene where a Nazi, one of the Nazi commanders, is even afraid of this Dr. Morrell and actually gives his own antidepressants and morphine because they're short on supplies in order to give it to aid to Adolf Hitler. So it's implied that antidepressants and morphine is need to treat it, to keep uh, Adolf Hitler, the zombie Adolf Hitler needs morphine and antidepressants to sort of keep his body afloat or something or keep it intact. It's implied that I'm reading between the lines, but so there is a little bit of a story here. <laughs> God forbid. I know Bruce Campbell. He just likes to have fun. His movies are, are army of the dead is fantastic. Uh, cult classic and you can see elements of that here too but there is a little bit of a maybe there's some added elements to the plot here that are enjoyable for anybody who wants to, to give it a look-see too edward rizzo's art's fantastic and those variant covers as as we've shown there are pretty damn good too so yeah this is definitely a, a series that i'm getting and uh hey if for no other reason i'm not i'm not usually one for just a cover buy but if i was just looking at covers you got three here you can't go wrong i mean you, you pick you know one one th pick a random number between one and three, you're going to end up with a pretty damn good cover. Yeah, that's a, that's accurate. hundred percent. Uh, okay. Up next, another Batman book, uh, Batman Gotham Knights gilded city. Number one, this is from writer Evan Narcisse. Abel is the artist. John is the colorist. I don't know why. I mean, John just, it just says John. I don't know. I keep going by just John. Steve Wands does the letters. Um, and a couple of cool covers here too. One by Greg Capullo. So uh, I know Greg has a, a huge number of fans, especially for his Batman stuff. So I imagine a lot of people are going to pick this up because it's Batman and it's number one and drawn by Grant Capullo. Uh, and then there's a variant cover by Yannick Paquette and Nathan Fairbairn. 
as well as a game design variant covered by Jim Lee, Scott Williams, and Alex Sinclair. So uh, I know that Gotham Knights has a new video game version of it coming out. So this must tie into that, but it didn't necessarily seem like it did when I, when I read it. So uh, anyway, what'd you think of this? Uh, it was, it was very different. Uh, it, uh, it, it actually is a story that on the surface, uh, w- when it started off, it seemed to be a very straightforward story where Batman and Batman and the, the Bat family are taking on what they, they're, they're combating against a, a new form of fear gas. And they suspect that it might be Scarecrow related, but Scarecrow's, it's not actually Scarecrow. Scarecrow is still in Arkham. So they're not sure uh, somebody has taken a compound based on Scarecrow's fear gas and modified it for skin absorption. And it mixes with skin oils and sweat and it becomes highly transmissible through the air and it causes people to be reckless with no fear. And instead of a, it, it, it almost creates a phobia connected with fashion, gaming and sneakers. And at one point I thought it was quite funny. Uh, I think it was Batgirl. I, uh, it's irrelevant who said it, but one of the Bat characters said, this isn't a phobia, this is FOMO, uh, which is, we comic collectors know what FOMO is. It's fear of missing out. And, and it, obs- it obsesses all the people of Gotham City where they become obsessed with something. So if it was, if we were, co- if you were a comic collector in Gotham City, we'd be obsessed. We'd be running to the comic book shop and, and our FOMO would uh, mix with this, with this new kind of compound would make us go crazy and obsessive. And to make it even worse, it causes cardiac arrest at the end. So this is uh, this is far arguably, arguably more deadly than even fear gas, because at least with fear gas, it wears off. And you may have experienced a fear and remember a nightmare, but you won't die from it usually. Uh, this, this particular compound will ultimately uh, result in cardiac arrest. Now, as they're figuring that out, there's, there's another side plot line, in, a, a side story here that doesn't seem to be connected to it, which I find very interesting that takes place in 1847 with the Underground Railroad road with uh, a characters by the name, uh, a, a black character by the name of Vivian Foxworthy is being smuggled, uh, I believe, out of the south. Well, obviously out of the south. It's an underground railroad. And there's this, there's this hero that is that shows up, this sort of runaway, this this character, almost like a, I guess you could say is the Batman of 1847, but I, I couldn't come across a name for him. They just referred to him as a, as a runaway. And he helped rescue this Vivian F- uh, Foxworthy so that she could end up with her, with her partner, Portia, in, in the safety of Gotham, and uh, this this Mr. Brindley is a lawyer who I suspect might be this 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 hero that helped save them from slave traders. And uh, there's a there's a tenement typhoid disease that's going around Gotham in 1847, and then that story sort of ends or just sort of it's we snapshot away from that back to present day Gotham where Batman traces the traces this gas into traces this compound into uh, Bloodhaven where he comes across Nightwing but Nightwing in this particular continuity this is a different universe is angry with Batman he says get out of my city we don't work anymore so uh it's interesting this, this story is called limited editions uh which is i think maybe a, a play on the collectability collector's aspect of it which is related to the compound which deals with our obsessions with fashion gaming and sneakers and the idea of FOMO versus phobia. And I thought it was very intriguing. I thought it was kind of unique. I thought it was a nice way to pull us comic collectors into the story. And I, I thought it was, uh, I think it's worth checking out. And I think this will probably get the attention of anybody who plays video games and wants to check out a good story. Yeah, uh, I've never played any of the Gotham Knights video games, so I can't speak to how well this might tie in. And, you know, as you said, there, there's like two timelines here. So is that part of the latest video game? Like, I, I have no idea. What I will say in, from this perspective of somebody who's never played any of the games, and if you just want, much like the audio adventures that we just talked about, a continuity-free Batman story that is admittedly sort of set back in the past when compared to, and I'm not just talking about the, the you know, past storyline, story thread that's set like in the 1800s. But said in the past in terms of, hey, this is Tim Drake as Robin. You know, this is, um, as as you said, a, a Nightwing that doesn't necessarily get along with Batman. I mean, that might be the way it is in the video game. I, I don't know. I thought in the video, in the Gotham Knights video game, or the Arkham Knight video game, I guess, that Batman was dead. So, I, yeah, I'm not familiar with that continuity or, or what have you. But I, I don't, 
I don't think you need to be to read this and enjoy it because it kind of was enjoyable as a standalone Batman story where you don't have to know anything else that's going on. And Tim Drake is my favorite Robin, so it works for me on that level. I thought the art was solid, um, but I, at the end of the day, I don't really think this is going to be memorable. DC puts out so much Batman stuff, it's kind of hard to, to stand out from the pack. So uh, anyway, give it, a, give it a look if you're so inclined. I imagine if you're a fan of the Gotham Knights video game, this might be additive. You can, might get more out of it. So, uh, All right, up next we have Batman the Beyond White Knight Book 6. This is script art cover and the 1 in 25 cover by Sean Murphy. Dave Stewart does the letters. Uh, I'm sorry, Dave Stewart does the colors and Josh Reed does the letters. Fiona Staples has uh, the variant cover. Uh, this one picks up right where the last one left off. It, we did see that uh, Jack Napier, otherwise known as Joker, did get a chance to, because he was sort of controlling Bruce's body, get a chance to kind of say the things he never got a chance to say to Harley, you know, say his goodbyes. It's interesting because it's a bit of a love triangle because Harley and Bruce and this continuity are actually married, uh, even though Bruce sees it as kind of a marriage of, of convenience and doesn't actually feel like he's worthy of Harley. It's just a very strange dynamic. And I've talked before about the interesting choices that Sean Murphy has made in terms of making uh, Jason Todd the first Robin as opposed to Dick Grayson. So there's a lot to unpack here in this alternate timeline, Sean Gordon Murphy verse. But the, the changes, even if Murphy made them inadvertently, they really work. They really provide something interesting and a different dynamic, um, especially when you talk about Jason Todd being the first Robin and how that affects Dick and Dick's relationship with Bruce. It all works really, really well. So this is a bit of a, a setup issue in terms of kind of tying up some of the things that have come before and putting all the... Um, the pieces in place, all the characters in place for the for the climax, um, with what's going on with powers, and he's uh, got this radioactive power now, and what that's going to mean going forward. And yeah. Harley's daughter, who he kind of was manipulating along with Terry McGinnis, now now being aware that he was that powers Derek Powers was lying to her. Um, so yeah, uh, and and Dick also finally realizing that being part of the GTO is probably not the path he should have gone on. Um, he kind of did it as a way to rebel against Bruce and rebel against his role uh, as Robin, and so everything has sort of come full circle. So uh, I'm I'm enjoying this. It's it's probably my favorite uh, Sean Gordon Murphy versus Batman White Knight series so far um which is good because i i think i like the first one best and and then the second one came out and I, I i still think the original was the best one but then the harley when harley quinn one came out the the murphy verse series uh focused on harley and i, I liked that one that that became my favorite because it was a better a version of harley that speaks to me more than kind of the zany crazy harley but the thing is, this this one, it still has the zany or, or still has the realistic Harley and not the zany crazy Harley. But Bruce is also out of prison and we're getting a version of Batman Beyond. So it's almost like this is this one has kind of the best of everything that we've had so far. Um, yeah. So I, I continue to be impressed with what Sean Gordon Murphy is able to do in this universe. And again, it's I, I wouldn't say that you could just dive into this and you're going to get the most out of it. But you can just read the Sean Gordon Murphy verse Batman stuff, and you don't have to read any regular DC continuity to get everything there is to get out of these uh, these books. Um, and the art is is fantastic. Uh, I encourage everybody who picks up this book this week to read the uh, essay. Usually, Sean puts uh, an essay in the back talking about why he made certain story choices. This one actually talks about his style, uh, his art style, how he developed it, which is uh, which is really interesting. Um, being that he was all in on image and um, Liefeld and Jim Lee and that sort of stuff and, and sort of explains how he arrived at the style that he's at. So uh, I definitely, especially if you're a big fan of Sean's art, I definitely encourage you to be sure to check that out. So uh, well, I know you're a big Sean Murphy fan. What'd you think of this? I really enjoyed it. This story really, uh, this is one of my favorite issues so far because uh, I mean, it, 
just just to backtrack a little bit in the original Batman in in, in the original White Knight series, the very first one, it ends with Batman or Bruce Wayne going to jail, and in this series. Ultimately, Bruce Wayne breaks out of jail, and Bruce Wayne states in this issue, after he wakes up with, with Harley at, at the beginning, uh, which was, uh, I'm sure uh, the, our ship, shippers of uh, Bruce Wayne and Harley will love this. I, I think it's fantastic. I love it. Uh, I love this Harley, too, just like you. And But Bruce, Bruce essentially tells Harley, look, I, I broke out, basically, to stop Derek Powers, and Derek Powers uh, was actually the one who worked with Bruce Wayne worked with Batman and gave Batman all the tech. It was Derek Powers that did that. And Derek Powers resented the fact when Bruce Wayne went to prison, Bruce Wayne resents the fact he feels that Bruce Wayne squandered being Batman. And of course, Derek Powers is more power hungry. But the other motivation that Bruce Wayne had to break out of prison was also to, to save his family. What he's in denial about, which is very well handled here by Sean, uh, Sean Murphy, is that he's in denial a little bit about his, his feelings for Harley. And maybe not just a little bit. I mean, Harley even... Uh, uh, Harley accuses him of being in denial and stop pushing me away. And, uh, and, and Bruce Wayne basically tells her, he says, look, I mean, this isn't love. This is trauma. I'm traumatized. We are both screwed up people. You're, you were, you, you were in love with a psychopath at one point. I'm Batman. I'm always dark, but he's being hard on himself. And I think what Sean, Sean Murphy's doing here is that he's giving his own psychological profile of Batman, but he's, he's letting the story tell that, tell that for him. He's not like a lot of writers who tell you in interviews what their story is about. Then you read the story and you're kind of going, eh, maybe. Uh, this actually, you can tell through the story, this is uh, this is just very well done, very well handled. There's a lot of interplay between Dick Grayson and Jason Todd. Uh, there's at the end, uh, of course, last, last issue we had Derek Powers become the character Blight, the villain Blight, the well-known character Blight, who was the supervillain in <coughs> the, the uh, mainstream continuity uh, Batman Beyond. And ultimately, uh, this is uh, Dick Grayson end up getting, uh, he even gets injured at the end, being shot by Blight. And the fate of Dick Grayson here, after finally giving up being a member of the GTO, which is essentially run and taken over by Derek Powers, i.e. Blight. Uh, all, all these things are coming into play here while they're trying to rescue Jackie, and uh, who's hacked into the system and has discovered her own truths about Derek Powers and how she's been manipulated. And again, Sean Murphy has done such a good job here weaving all these plot lines along with fantastic art. This is really well done. This is shaping up to be my favorite of the, I think this is the third one, or is it the fourth one with the Harley series now? I think it's the third one. <laughs> Anyways, the Murphy verse. Well, no, the, we had the first one and then we had the return. We had White Knight, then we had the return, and then we had Harley. Yeah, this is the fourth series. This is the fourth plus, one. Thank you. Yeah, plus we had the two, the two part um, Red Hood. Right. Oh, that's right. Those one shots with the Red yeah. Herd. And we should say that the Red Herd is in this issue along with Gone, Gan or Gone yeah. is his sidekick. And so it's all very well played. It's all coming together pretty well. Uh, everything meshes. Uh, there's no, you know, there's within his own universe, he's maintained the continuity with his, within his own Murphy verse. And, you know, kudos to him. There's not too many writers that can, uh, you know, work for DC and brag that they got their own universe all to themselves. So. This can. This is a series that continues to uh, continues to entertain me. Yeah, uh, it's it, it is really really good, and um, uh, we talked talked about this last time about how interesting the world is, and if I wonder if at some point Sean Gordon Murphy is going to let other other writers, other creators play around in it. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Uh, all right, up next we have Action Comics number one thousand forty eight. This is Kal-El Returns Part 3 from writer Philip Kennedy Johnson. Art is by Mike Perkins. Colors by Lee Luffridge. Letters by Dave Sharp. What would you think of this? I, let me see here, sorry. Uh, uh, not, not bad, not bad. I guess uh, Superman is finally home. And um, whether, regardless of how I might feel about it, because I got mixed feelings about the, the expansion of the Superman family. Uh, but make no doubt, we have a huge expansion of the Superman family here. And we're getting, we got these twins. We got these twins, Orthora and Osora. Orthora Oth and Osora, the, the twin brother and sister of, uh, of the of Phaeologians that, that Superman brought back from War World. And Osora, the boy, he has the power of Ogrim. He's got the fire of Ogrim within his system. Uh, he was actually killed by Mongol, and in order to save Osora's life, Superman 
uh, stabbed uh, Osulra with the with the fires of Olgrim and basically gave him that, that power. And this issue this issue starts off with Lex Luthor having a conversation with with John Corbin, who because Luthor wants to use John Corbin, who is Metallo, to basically merge him with some war world tech that Luthor has in order to make him more powerful and use against Superman. John or Gor Corbin is all depressed. Metallo doesn't want to do that. He tells Luthor to go fly a kite. But Luther knows that John Corbin only cares about one thing, and that's his sister who visits him all the time. So Lex Luthor essentially manipulates events to cut off the visitation into jail while John, John Corbin's sister, Tracy Corbin, stops visiting him. And ultimately, that will lead John Corbin to take up Luther on his offer and probably be used to attack Superman. Meanwhile, Lois is taking Ortho Ra and Osul Ra to the zoo where they meet up with Bibbo and... Uh, Superman is in space cleaning up the debris in space from the aftermath of uh, War World and and sending off other war other refugees to other planets, and and Superman sees that somebody is going to be gonna, he's going to be getting company. There's a spaceship coming to Earth, and ultimately it it ends up being both the new gods and the gods of Apocalypse. We got uh, we got Orion, we got uh, Metron, we got Kalibak, we got Desaad. They end up showing up and they want the fire of Olgrim. And of course, they, because they, you know, they, they fear what it could do. They fear that it could corrupt Superman because they think it's still in Superman. They discover that it's in a young boy, this young boy, Ulcera. So they want to take uh, a young boy. They want to take Ulcera because he's got the fires of Olgrim in him. And in, in what I think is a very, very important scene, Superman, when Orion, Orion can be a real bastard. He's the son of Darkseid, and he basically says his ultimatum, Osul Ra is coming with us, whether you like it or not. Uh, Superman, kal -El, has a memory of his father, jor saying, I'm here for the boy. And he remembers when he let his son, John, go with jor -El, he lost all those years with his son. And, and Superman says, right, all right, he goes, over my dead body. He's not, he's not going to let these kids, these orphan kids go, uh, like, because you, you, I like that. It's almost like you can. He feels guilty. He's having a flashback. It's almost like a post-traumatic stress memory of, oh my God, I did this once to John. I let John go against my better instincts. I'm not going to do it again. And Superman, of course, ends up battling uh, Orion and uh, the new gods, and the, and he's not going to let them take uh, take take them. And that battle continues to ensue by the end of the issue, uh, where ultimately. Uh, it ends with John Corbin in his cell, Metallo in his cell, realizing that his sister is no longer going to be visiting him. So, and then the next issue promises a more battle between Superman and the New Gods. But I really like this issue. It's very action packed, and it I I, I really appreciated that scene between with Superman remembering uh, his. Uh, losing John Kent to, to jor before they went off into space and it, it led to the aging up of John Kent and at least that's how I interpreted it I would be curious to know how you thought about it yeah that was by far the highlight of the issue as well that was what I was going to mention um, yeah he clearly feels uh, kind of a fatherly protectiveness over this brother and sister um, especially the boy uh, because yeah he he lost his uh, he lost his son, and even though John Kent returned, obviously we know with the whole aging up or what have you, um, and uh, it's clear that he he sees both of them as a, as a surrogate, you know, almost as a, a stand in, and with um, with also Ra being the same age as John was when he left, and and kind of looking similar, you know, same same color hair, same uh, kind of color skin. Um, it's clear that he sees uh, his a, a lot of John in um, in also Ra. So I, I appreciated that. Unfortunately, the the rest of it, I, I just don't know how well that it, that it works. And part of it is as much as I love Mike Perkins' art, I don't care for Mike Perkins on on Superman, especially because of the way um, Lee Luffridge colors it. Right, like this is very similar colors to what we saw in Ron V's Swamp Thing run, which was also by Mike Perkins. And it, it works in that in that story because it's a bit more of a, I don't want to say a depressing story, but it, it's not, uh, it's not kind of hopeful or traditionally super heroic. It's much more of a 
kind of a serious story and a grounded story. That's not necessarily what I want out of my superhero comics. Uh, we know what a fantastic world builder Philip Kennedy Johnson is. And when you talk about bringing in other interesting characters that maybe are a little underused, having the new gods show up here with, uh, with Calabac and Orion and Metron, I mean, that, that that's cool stuff. These are really powerful characters that are, you know, well suited to, uh, to battle Superman on kind of equal footing. So I want this to be, you know, brightly colored and I want the art to be really traditionally super heroic. And that's just not what we, what we get here. And it sort of colored my outlook on, on the issue to some extent. Um, and that's not to, to say anything about Mike Perkins actual technical skill, because it's done very, very well. And there are moments, especially like you said, when Superman says over my dead body, it's a close up of his eyes. I mean, that, that's an awesome panel. Um, but just the overall aesthetic and feel of the book for most of the, most of the time, it doesn't, the style and this aesthetic just doesn't work for me as well as something that was a little, was a little more super heroic might. And then we also have the other storyline going on with Metallo, um, which I find to be really interesting. I give John Corbett a lot of credit, for, you know, for telling Lex Luthor, yeah, uh, when you lose to Superman again and he's kicking your ass, you know, tell him I said hello, because that's, we all know that's what's going to happen, you know, and even yeah. Metallo is, is going to be forced into that because yeah, he loves his sister and he wants to protect her. And the only way he can is to give in to Luther and, you know, do what Luther wants, which again, just shows what a despicable human Lex Luthor is. But at the same time, um, even though it's meta, it is still kind of old and tropey, uh, that we're bringing in Metallo, uh, even with, you know, added war world tech, it's still Metallo against Superman, which isn't, isn't anything new as opposed to the Superman versus the new gods, which feels, you know, a little more unique and something we haven't seen a, a bunch of times. So maybe that's why Kennedy Johnson is doing it. Maybe that's why he's bringing in this new gods storyline. So at least it's that, that feels fresh, you know, but, it, but it's almost like, but then you chose Metallo, which again, I mean, a very classic Superman villain. Um, but it's almost like with the new gods and that feeling so new and fresh, it, it almost makes the upcoming battle with, um, with Metallo that's being kind of foreshadowed here, even look more kind of cliched, I yeah. guess. It'll be comparison. interesting to see maybe, maybe there's going to be a new power. If he's got, if he's got orphan box tech, merged with metallo and kryptonite you know who knows what what's in the mind of pkj you know so um uh he's impressed me with the war world so i'd be curious to see what he does with that combination of uh, a new power set for metallo we'll see yeah it's so interesting like you know when you think about the people heroes with the best rogues gallery and we talk about all the time batman and spider-man probably the two that have the kind of the best but superman was first right but when you think about his rogues gallery of villains they're not exactly i mean obviously luther is, is up there luther's up there is one of the greatest comic book villains of all time but then you 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 very quickly start thinking okay well who else like there's not a lot especially if you go back to classic right like you could say toy man probably parasite mixes pitalik mongol um and, and you, that's kind of it right metallo obviously is probably one of them as well is sort of newer um and you could talk about some of the newer ones, Conduit, uh, Maxima, but I mean, th these aren't, these aren't characters that, you know, the average person would know as opposed to if you start talking about Batman villains and start naming them off, you know, Riddler, Penguin, Two-Face, Joker, obviously like worldwide people know those characters, right? You start talking about Green Goblin and Dr. Octopus and uh, you know, the Rhino and all, like Kingpin, people know those characters as well. So it's so interesting because everybody knows Superman, right? Probably the most well-known, you know, character, comic book character in the world. Um, but people don't know his villains other than Lex Luthor, which I, I find to be interesting. And it's one of the reasons why every time they make another Superman movie, really, here we go with Lex Luthor again, kind of like Batman. They always make it the Joker. Like they have such a rich gallery of heroes. Like, can we get somebody else? Yeah. Um, as far as the backup in this issue, Red Moon Part 2 from writer Philip Kennedy Johnson. David Lapham is the artist. Colors by Trish uh, Mulvihill. Letters by Dave Sharp. It's okay. Um, they're starting to talk about uh, Supergirl trying to to train up um, the theologian Theola, who was kind of saved in the, the backup feature that was happening while Superman was on Warworld. Uh, but we're also getting hints of 
kind of the future of Superman. We, we talked a few episodes ago about the Superman news that came out of New York Comic Con. This definitely looks like a, a different costume for uh, for Supergirl here. Connor is back in his 90s costume for whatever reason. But they're flying around the world and they're trying to find the, the minions of the Mongol that was and find out uh, what they want, what they're doing. And so it's it's the first hints we're getting, first seeds being planted for that um, that kind of future Superman family story that's going to be told in uh, – in one in one of the, one of the stories of the action comics, I guess anthologies. Or, I mean, it's going to have three different stories, right? We're going to have the Philip K. Johnson story, we're going to have the Dan Jurgen story, and then we're going to have the Leah Williams Power Girl story. So, um, some seeds planted here. It's fine. Um, I wasn't as anybody who listens to the podcast on a regular basis knows. I wasn't a huge fan of the War World storyline, so I'm kind of ready to just leave it in the past. Um, but it does seem like that's not there. Kenny Johnson's not quite ready to let it go. Maybe he feels like he didn't get enough time with these villains, these, uh, lieutenants of the Mongol that was, and he wants uh, a little more time with them. So it, it's yeah. fine. It's not really memorable. Like, like with a lot of these backups, as we always say, I'd rather pay a dollar less and skip the backup. So any thoughts yeah. on, on the back? Well, backing? they're, they're, they're expanding the Superman family and they inevitably, uh, I actually, I actually really love some of my fondest memory as a young man, a uh, young boy was reading the Superman family, uh, comic book coming that came out monthly for the, the giant dollar comics, the Superman family. I actually really enjoyed that. And they're, they're clearly in, this feels like a Superman family. You got the, the super boys, you got Kion Kang, the, 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 super, the new Superman from whatever China. And you got all uh, John Kent and steel and Natasha irons and the new Supergirl with her longer blue tights and Thela And you got the twins now and the orphan kids. I mean, this is she, very much expanding. It doesn't feel like Superman anymore. On the other hand, this could be, this is, Let's be blunt. This is the Superman of a new generation. And that's what this backup, I think, is slowly developing. And there's even talk. At one point, Supergirl even tells Theola that, uh, you know, that Metropolis is a lot, you know, in 20,000 years, Metropolis will look just like, crypt, you know, Argo City did or crypto, Kryptonian cities did. And so, I mean, I, very clearly, they're trying to establish new mythology. It's, it'll be up to individual readers. I'm an old school reader. I, I kind of don't want things to change too quickly. I don't. I find. I find that this change has been so fast, so quick. All of a sudden, we have this huge family. All of a sudden, John Kent is aged up. Not to be, you know. All of a sudden, Superman's got this huge family. Now he's got like. Now he's got two adopted kids. And uh, I mean, good grief. I mean, uh, um, <laughs> anyways, I. I'm. I got some mixed feelings about it. Writing is fine. I guess you know if we're gonna have an expanded Superman family, it's all. It all depends on where the story goes, but. Uh, I got mixed feelings about it, but we'll see where it goes uh, moving forward. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, okay, up next, whew, Punchline: The Gotham Game Part One. Uh, so here, here comes. Was that a punchline. sigh? Was that was that it? Yeah, that a oof, yeah. Oof, I, I, again, anybody who's listened to the podcast for a long time knows how I feel about Punchline. Super derivative character, not interesting. Um, meta in in the fact that she can somehow espouse lies and just come right out and, and say, I didn't kill anybody during the Joker war and blah, blah. It's, it's way too close to reality, right? How you can, especially in the, this country, in the United States, where you can come right out and just lie and say, this is actually the truth. And if somebody confronts you with the facts, oh, those are alternative facts. Like, no, facts are facts. And the fact is, Punchline's a murderer, Punchline's a psychopath, Punchline's a human piece of garbage. And not interesting, not interesting in the slightest. Don't care for her at all. Um, so I'm not really that interested in, in reading this. That being said, you know, for the sake of the podcast, I'm, I'm checking it out. It's written by Tinny Howard and Blake Howard. Uh, the art is by Gleb Melnikoff. Luis Guerrero does the colors. Becca carry on letters. I didn't even find the art to be as clean as when Melnikoff was doing the art for Robin. Uh, it's not bad art by any stretch, and he is a good visual storyteller, but it just, like I said, it wasn't quite as clean. It, it felt a little bit rushed, so not not his best work. In terms of the actual story, you know, I, I actually enjoyed the pages where Bruce showed up 
but that's about three pages. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. it really does focus a lot on punchline and well, it is called punchline. <laughs> yeah, and fair yeah, fair enough. This is her series. This isn't a Batman title. This is her series. So I would expect it to to focus on her, but I gotta be honest, I I don't know if I'm gonna be able to bring myself to read more of this. Like again, I, g- kudos to Tinny Howard and Blake Howard for making this very relevant. You know, I talked about Punchline being a meta character and, and in this she's crafting these these drugs which are sold as incense in convenience stores so again this is pulled right from reality you know uh well it's not marketed to be crushed up and smoked but yet why why is it being sold in convenience stores you know um this is something that kids actually do i don't know if it's the best idea to have put this in a comic (laughs) you're gonna get kids who didn't know about this like what i can get high by going and buying incense at the convenience store and crushing it up and smoking it so I don't know. It's a little too dark and a little too depressing for me. So it, it's just, this is not for me. It's not my cup of tea. And why would it be? I, I don't really care for the character. So, you know, it's not something that I really can give a, probably a fair or honest uh, review of because I, I'm predisposed to dislike it because I dislike the character. In terms of like the pacing and the setup, this visual storytelling, like technically this is a very well done comic. Um, I find the the pacing here and the setup to be better. Well, I should say more consistent than the pacing in the Catwoman story that Tinny Howard is writing. I don't know if that's because this is a bit of a smaller story and she doesn't feel the need to squeeze so much in um, because we've talked before about how Catwoman, the pacing is a little uneven. The pacing here is great. That's one of the things that's hardest to get, uh, get correct. So, there are some some interesting mysteries in terms uh, and and interesting seeds planted in terms of punchline trying to basically take over the royal flush gang and and have them be her minions, um, and the fact that Batman's on her on her trail, uh, maybe he can actually put her in prison and make her stay there. Um, but I almost think she, just <laughs> based on the type of character she is, that doesn't necessarily make her any less powerful. You know, she was in prison for a long time while her trial was going on and. She was still able to have a great amount of influence and still have a criminal empire, the the beginnings of a criminal empire. So in that way, she is a dangerous villain and she is very smart and very formidable. Um, So it's kind of like you got to, you know, lock her up somewhere where she, you know, like a Faraday cage or something where she has no contact with anybody. Um, I don't know. She's just, she's not, she's not for me. Uh, But I think you enjoy her a lot more. So what do you think? Well, I, I I thought her initial her punchline as a backup to the Joker series was horribly done, but what what they I could understand and I I called it early on that she was going to be acquitted, and it, it it made sense because you want to keep yeah, her on the playing so field, obvious. and it, it 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 plays in. I always thought punchline's best portrayal would be if she's portrayed as someone who's a master at manipulating the media. And it that was not well done in the in the backup feature. Just be, she ended up getting acquitted, but through a terrible series of a jumbled, messed up story, and it made no sense that she was acquitted because it was just a badly written story that didn't actually focus on what it needed to focus on and make its point. But I digress. This and this is where I'm gonna I'm gonna disagree with you. I actually enjoyed this, and 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 I enjoyed this for a number of reasons, which are maybe a little bit quirky. But I love the fact that. Um, Punchline does here what I, I thought she should have done in the first place in the backup feature. This should have been the first outing for Punchline. Have her get her get her a quick acquittal, and then here she is. She's approaching. Uh, she approach. She saves a kid who gets beat up, who's basically a, a glorified YouTuber, and uh, she ends up uh, saving this kid because she wants to utilize him for his YouTube channel. Uh, this uh, Navy Seal is his uh, name. And uh, she wants to help generate, help this kid generate content. So she says she just wants to manipulate him for her own nefarious purposes, likely create different maybe identities on, on social media. She's essentially, she wants to, her master plan, she, she ends up approaching the Royal Flush Gang in a very unique way. The Royal Flush Gang, this Rex and Regina Quintain, they're actually retired. They're retired members of the Royal Flush Gang, the same related to the Royal Flush Gang. They've got, they've got a gang of members all over America and members of the Royal Flush Gang were actually in prison. That's how Punchline became uh, 
became uh, affiliated with some members of the Royal Flush Gang while in prison. And in any event, this Rex and uh, uh, Regina, this Rex and Regina Quintain, they're actually looking for a, they're looking for a sex partner. And they put an ad and Punchline shows up. And I thought, geez, is this a PG-13 comic or is this going to be a little higher rated? And anyways, Punchline shows up, but she's there not to engage in, in the, uh, in, in, in foreplay. Uh, rather, she's there to make, she's there to make a proposal to him because Rex and Regina Quintain, they have all the manpower. They're retired, but she wants to entice them as, and say, and she, she essentially says to them throughout the issue in various parts. And I'm reading I'm reading some of this into it that she's got sort of like the social media brains and the bronze and she's got this like you said this drug this this is a totally legal drug mixing legal mixtures and she's and she wants to use their resources the Royal Flush Gang's resources to spread it and everything else what I like about it and the reason why I I just I counter your point where I think there's potential here is this is actually the punchline who I she's finally starting to maybe earn some cred She's still at the bottom rung in the ladder. She's slowly trying to gain some reputation. I think she's biting off more than she can do. She takes it upon herself that she wants to lead the Royal Flush Gang. I don't think that's really something she can do. She's not good enough yet for that. Uh, and it's important that Teeny, uh, uh, Teeny and um, uh, Blake Howard, that they remember that she's just at the beginning of her criminal career to pull her back a bit, let her earn her cred. And I love that Bruce Wayne, Bruce Wayne's had enough. She, he, she's got acquitted. Bruce Wayne knows she's guilty. Bruce Wayne, she's going to come up against Batman. And I really, really hope this series ends with Punchline back in prison. I, I, re, I know it's called Punchline, but she really has to spend, she's got to spend some time in prison. I mean, if the Joker spends all that time in pr prison, so does Punchline. If this ends with Punchline, just run away, running off into the sunset, criminal sunset, it just, it won't work for me. But anyways, I think this has potential. And, um... Glob Melnikov on the art. I liked his art in Robin, although it was more dynamic in Robin. But I really like to see uh, Bruce Wayne undercover here. Uh, usually when we see Bruce Wayne undercover, it's, uh, I forget the name of his usual undercover identity. Matches Malone. Matches Malone, yeah. He's, he, I don't think he's Matches Malone here, or maybe he is. He doesn't, he's, he's unidentified by name here, but he, he looks pretty damn cool and he looks pretty built. And so anyways, I thought it was a nice, uh, it reminds me of uh, some callbacks. I, I always like when Bruce Bat when Batman goes undercover and looks like a badass in a different way other than wearing bat, bat leather. But uh, uh, I thought this had potential here. So I have, I have a little bit more hope than you do on this title going forward. Yeah, again, it's just it's just a dislike of the of the character. Um, <laughs> I just don't care for her, you know. Like I, I get what Tynan was trying to do, you know. We need a true, more indicative female version of the Joker. Uh, you know, obviously we've had the Joker's daughter at various times. We had Harley, but you know, none of them are a true female version of the Joker. Punchline is closer to a true female version of the Joker than any character we've had previously. Here's the thing. I don't like the Joker. So why would I like, why would I like or want a female version of the Joker? I wouldn't. That's the, you know, that's the answer. Um, so yeah, I mean, whether or not it, it works or not, I mean, honestly, I, I, I sort of wish that the hero of this piece um, or the, the person that was going up against punchline was Damien. Uh, you know, we saw Damien at one point when he's with the teen Titans doing exactly what I was saying about just locking the villains away. Not giving him a trial, not, you know, I kind of would want that. Like at the, yeah, the last page of this series, Punchline is locked away in this deep, dark, you know, cave somewhere. It, nobody knows where she is and, and she, you know, she's got no ability to manipulate or, uh, yeah, tr truly give her what she deserves, you know? So anyway, uh, I'm going to warn everybody, rant incoming. Uh, Tim Drake, Robin number two is the next <laughs> book we're going to talk about uh megan fitzmartin is on the script riley Mar rosmo does the art lee luffridge on colors and rob lee on letters so uh be gentle rocky but go ahead <laughs> oh, oh, it's, oh it's my rant okay uh well look uh this title is um uh, i don't think this title is for everybody it's 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 not it's not for me uh, i think this title uh -huh. is um i actually and more flattering toward the art than I am the story. I have, uh, I try, I, I would be lying if I said I read this comic book twice. I read it once and then I thought I better read it again. And then I, I could only get like quarters of, uh, you know, a quarter of a way through it a second time. And I couldn't, I just, I, 
I just couldn't. And it wasn't because of the art. It was because of the storytelling. I, I'm accustomed to uh, Riley Rosmo's art. Uh, and it, it, you know, I can differentiate between the characters on his art. And I know it's not for everybody. That's I'm, I'm actually accustomed to Riley Rosmo enough that his art does not take me out of the story. Right. But, you know, miles can vary on that. And uh, but the, the art here, it, the, the one thing that that drove me sort of it, it, it frustrated me to no end. I mean, again and again, I mean, there's pages here with Tim Drake just angsting over his boyfriend, Bernard. I don't know. He's dated this guy three times and he's talking about wanting to spend his life with Bernard. And what? Um I just I, I don't I don't get it. You're you're what are you eighteen years old and what is this the the what is this the second person you've ever dated in your life and I I just I didn't buy it for a second and Bern, and he just comes across as just profoundly stupid. Uh, now I don't I, I can't I can't relate to this. I he, he he tries to compare. He feels that he's failing to protect Bernard like he. Like he's failing with Bernard, like he failed with Stephanie. He didn't fail with Stephanie, his previous partner. He didn't fail with Stephanie. He just broke up with her because he discovered he was gay or bisexual. Hey, so what's the big deal? But they're they're harping on this, and and I don't know why. And it's it's aggravating to no end. It doesn't serve the the narrative. It's meant to drive to 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 focus on, I guess, his character and his. I guess he's. He's he doesn't want to open up to Bernard and Bernard knows that there's something he's not telling him. And uh, why would you tell somebody you're just dating that you're Robin? Is it is this is this what constitutes angst? I guess it does. I But it's ridiculous. Uh, I, 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 I'm i going to draw a comparison to like Spider-Man was Peter Parker for years. Never, never dreamt to tell Mary Jane he was Spider-Man. I mean, I guess maybe she'd always known anyway, but it just seems so what a I, I don't. I don't agree with the approach at all on this with the character of Tim Drake. It's this is a, a disastrous approach from the beginning. I don't like it. I find it irritating. And but maybe I could get distracted if this story made it. This story makes no sense. Somehow he goes from fighting these this floating discs that create white projection, white animals, and it leads him for some reason, which is never really explained that I don't get it, takes him to the library. And then the librarian gets killed, and then he angsts, and he's and he blames himself for the death of the librarian. This is this is I really tried to follow the logic here, and I couldn't. Um, I just I, I I couldn't. I am I literally I want to stop talking now, <laughs> and the reason why I want to stop talking is that I'm just going to end up saying the same things over and over again, and I don't want to. There's no point. My mom always said, if you can't say anything nice, don't say nothing at all. So in the interest of, di of diplomacy, I'm just going to say that this comic book, it, to the extent that it had a story, it, it, I didn't catch on to it. Uh, I didn't appreciate it. I, 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 never really, I never felt really what it was trying to say. I feel the characterizations are all over the place. And it's just not working for me. And it's not because of the art. I'm not blaming, blaming Riley Rosmo on this. I don't think any artist could make this story make sense. And uh, I'll just leave it at that. I'm not even mentioning the writer's name because I don't see the point. But it, it's just it's not for me. So that's not much of a rant, but I, you know, I, I want to cushion the blow. <laughs> yeah, um, I wish I could say that I that I disagreed because, um, you know, I just got finished saying how um, Tim Drake is my favorite Robin. This is so wildly different than. You know, the first Tim Drake Robin series that we got back in the day, which was re really the first solo Robin series that went on for over 100 issues. Um, it, it was so good. And and this is this is not that. And that's not to say that this is, you know, bad necessarily, um, but it, it's not it's not working for me either. Uh, it, it's it's sort of hard to follow. It, it jumps around and I I, I get the feeling like I've, I've said with some other books that we've read recently, I just mentioned it with Catwoman, that Megan uh, Fitzmartin has so much that she wants to put in here. The only way she can make it all fit is to have these big time jumps that coincide with these leaps of logic that Tim Drake makes during his investigation that sort of don't make sense. Like, well, how did you... I mean, I know the guy's supposed to be really smart, 
but we're defying logic here in terms of making you know one deduction to the next um, with with some you know Sherlock Holmes scene of all things to 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 be kind of the the sequitur. It, it doesn't really it doesn't really make sense. Um, and unlike you, um, I think the Riley Rosmo art is the wrong choice for this. Uh, I think with a different artist, maybe this could flow a little better and be a little bit easier to understand. Again, it's not to say that the storytelling is bad or the emotion is bad in the art, but when you have art that's so stylized, like Rosmo's style, and you have a disjointed story in terms of pacing, I think that that's just a bad, that's a bad marriage. You know, you could have the art helping to fill in those gaps where the, the pacing does, uh, or the story feels like it takes a little bit of a jump. You can put little things in there to, to kind of make it make sense, but that's not what's, what's happening here. And, and I, again, like the art on its own is fine. It's cool with this, uh, stylized kind of montage, uh, piece or look that Riley does on several pages. I mentioned Sherlock Holmes. It's like, okay, we've got Sherlock, there's Sherlock Holmes, him and Sparrow, Sparrow being a, a former member of the We Are Robins group, who's, uh, we saw in the first issue, it's kind of befriended Tim. Uh, or spending, I mean, they were already friends, but spending some time together. We see the, those two as Sherlock and Watson. And then a little further down the page, one of them is, um, I, I guess, Sparrow would be the femme fatale. And Tim looks more like a, a, a detective, a kind of a, an old pulp detective in like a Raymond Chandler novel. And you scroll down a little farther and Tim is shaggy and... Uh, Sparrow is Velma and you've got what is clearly Scooby-Doo right there. So there are little fun pieces like that. That's a great art, but in, that's how we get from point A to point B. And Tim makes these leaps of logic with a page like that. Like that's not, that doesn't flow really. It's fun, but it doesn't flow. So yeah, I wish I could disagree because I, I, I love what Megan Fitzmartin is doing here. I, I will disagree with Rocky on one point and that's the fact that I don't mind that Tim is not sure who he is. That, in my mind, that, that makes sense. I had a hard time with it at first because he was so, he seemed to be so self assured in that previous series that I mentioned. And he was highly achieving and um, very much an overachiever, even. And, and um, we all sort of saw him as uh, this thing to aspire to be, right? Um, but in talking to Megan about the way that she sees Tim, it made a lot of sense to me of where he's at in his life. So he's kind of discovering himself for the first time. And, you know, I've talked about this before in terms of this character and, and the way um, Fitzmartin is characterizing him. There's There are some people that sort of have it figured out at the age Tim is right now. You know, like they're they're in college, they know what they want to do with their career, and they're uh, they're well on their way and they have everything together. But there's plenty of others who just aren't sure. But that's the interesting part about uh, Tim because he, he seemed to be on one end of the spectrum and really have it all together. He knew he, what he was doing. He was Robin and what he wanted to do with his life and you know, sort of had it all together and, and was kind of this role model. And then come to find out, and again, it's you know, 30 years have gone by in real time, but maybe only maybe five or 10 in comic book time. And he is, he's in his middle 20s, early to mid 20s, and he's hes really unsure. He's unsure of who he is. That's part of why he's just, uh, you know, sort of experimenting with his sexuality. It, you know, he, they're not saying he's homosexual. They're saying he's bisexual. So could this relationship with Bernard be what makes him happy? Could he possibly end up back, back with Stephanie? Could it be another female? Could it be another male? Like, we don't know. He's out there trying to figure out who he is. It is a little more kind of... Uh, relatable in terms of um, certainly the, the way the generations have worked. It used to be by the time, you know, and my parents' generation, by the time you were like 20 years old, you were out of the house, you had a job and you were getting married and having kids. That's just not the way that it is anymore, you know? Um, and so I, I sort of appreciate the fact that Megan is sort of updating Tim in a lot of ways and, and ma making him, you know, more relevant. It doesn't make sense if you think about it in real time, right? Because Tim would be what in his forties now, mid forties, late forties, yeah. if he had aged in real time, but that's not what these comic characters do. Right. So um, there's potential for some story here and there's potential to explore things. And um, I think not I, one of the complaints I've heard about her series is, is she's not being 
respectful to and not honoring what came before, but to hear her talk about it. And when she explains it, you go back and you look and you, you see really the seeds um, were planted back then, maybe not purposely from the writers that were working on it, but she is pulling from stuff from back then. Um, and it actually makes sense. So hopefully we're going to have her on at some point to, to talk about all this. But um, unfortunately this it, it's in my mind, it's a, it's a failure of pacing that's going on. And, and again, if the pacing were, a little smoother, or if the art was helping to smooth over the rough parts of the pacing, like if one or the other, I think this would work a lot better, but I'm struggling with this. Like I, I didn't think the first issue was bad at all. Um, I thought it was above average. This is, is average at best, maybe even slightly below average. So, uh, you know, maybe I'll change my mind when we get a, a few other issues under our belt, but yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with this. I will say, however, that it has one heck of a cover that is an homage to what is it detective comics number 39 i think or 34 whichever was the first appearance of of robin back in the day um but this time instead of batman with robin jumping through you've got uh nightwing with the tim drake version uh jumping through so that that's it that is a fun cover uh, all right. Well, on to something uh, a little more positive, I hope. Um, Catwoman, Lonely City, issue number four, written, drawn, colored, and lettered by Cliff Chang. This was a lot of fun. This series, I really enjoyed. I love this more realistic take on Catwoman. I love the emotion. I loved this idea of, you know, I was just talking about characters aging in real time. Um and this is much more of that. This is an older cat woman. She ends up getting a knee replacement at the end of this. Uh, it's just, it's a lot of fun seeing an, an older poison ivy, an older cat woman. Um, and Selena's kind of love for Bruce who died well before the series started. Um, all of that works really, really, really well. Tons of action, a great resolution, but also seeds planted for this story to continue this version of Gotham city with Barbara Gordon as the police com commissioner to uh, continue. It's so interesting, like we're getting all these different stories where um, Barbara is either uh, uh, run running for mayor or she's a police commissioner, or uh, I mean, even Future State Gotham, as much as we didn't necessarily like that, um, or, or a former police commissioner as she is in the Sean Gordon Murphy verse. So uh, I find that to be really interesting. It's almost like, and I don't know if DC is doing this purposefully, but it's almost like, they're ready to put Jim Gordon kind of to the side and, and really lessen his role and have Barbara almost take over that role in a lot of ways. We're seeing a lot of Barbara right now out of the Batwoman costume, which I'm, I'm sort of fine with. Um, she's, she's an interesting character. She's very intelligent. So it works for me on a lot of those levels. So I really enjoyed this. I thought um, Cliff Chang's art was, was really fantastic. It's a, it's more dynamic in my mind than the art that he did um on his Wonder Woman run for the New Fifty Two, which is probably the most you know, well known. This other series I've read, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, the one that I've I'm the most experienced with. I know he's done other stuff. Yeah, he's he's done uh, Paper but I haven't Girls. Really is also that. popular too. Paper Girls with. Uh, yeah, yeah, and I have yeah, I have read that. I have read that, but I mean that's not really superheroes. But in terms of superheroes, yeah. I felt like I because I, I wasn't a big fan of his work on Wonder Woman. I thought it was it felt a little static. Like it, it didn't feel like it flowed. Uh, it wasn't real kinetic. This is very kinetic. So uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, now to my nitpick about the series. One of the things I, I didn't enjoy, um, and that was the big, the big delay after the first three issues uh, and then this last one. And I, I mean, no, I'm not pointing a finger at, at Cliff Chang because the guy wrote it, he drew it, he colored it, he lettered it. That takes time. A hundred percent, it takes time. And I want him to take the time he needs to, to do his best and give a great story, which he did. I put the fault on DC for, they should have not released the first issue until he was at least halfway done with the fourth issue. Because if there's anything that I didn't like, it was the momentum. Like I was all in when this was coming out, you know, month after month after month, and it had really great momentum and it was really enjoyable. So I don't want to diminish the end of this story and say that it's not worth reading or, or anything like that by any means. But I, I don't think this landed with the same weight 
for me that it would have had there not been that delay. And I feel like I need to go back and reread from the beginning to sort of get the emotional payoff. But I, I still won't get the same level of emotional payoff that I would have if it had come out in a timely fashion. Because now I'm going to go back and read the first three and then reread this, but I already know how it ends. So it's not going to be that same level of, of payoff for me, even though it will be just as um, enjoyable probably as, as when I read it the first time. So yeah, I just, I hate it when things are delayed, especially multi multiple months. Like we went three months waiting for this final yeah. issue. So yeah, that, that in my mind is just, that was poor planning on DC editorials part. So anyway, what did you think? Uh, I, I enjoyed the ending here. I, I mean, just uh, just uh, for for those listening, I can tell you that this story ultimately was premised around uh, in ten years ago. Batman was killed in in it that when the Joker died, Batman died on the same day, uh, and Catwoman it was sent to prison for ten years. Uh, but and it's it's finally revealed in this issue that you know because the whole point of this series has been Catwoman and uh, teams up with. Uh, the Riddler, Eddie, Edward Nigma, and uh, Edward Nigma's the Riddler's daughter, uh, Eddie, or, or Edie, uh, to basically break into the Batcave, and and they also have uh, Jason, uh, Jason Blood, the Demon, helps them out, and uh, and even Clayface helped them out last issue, and he ended up dying. And ultimately, what I love about the payoff in this issue is we finally figure out, finally figure out why they finally managed to break into the Batcave, and it's revealed that before Batman died. He encoded Selena's DNA onto his Batarang so that, but she needs to get into the Batcave in order to uh, access the Bat computers to see what the big deal is. There's something in the Batcave that can save Gotham. And we were wondering what the hell that is. In the meantime, Barbara Gordon is running for mayor against Two Face. And Two Face is, of course, uh, he's really, of course, he's evil and he's manipulating events behind the scenes. And he wants to get into the Batcave and get the secrets of the Batcave. And there's uh what what really works well here is when they finally get into the bat cave they finally get into the bat cave ivy ends up sacrificing her life so you've lost eddie uh you've lost ivy you've lost clayface and uh selena uh, uh the, the bat cave's about to be uh destroyed and she's ultimately rescued by uh uh by the riddler by eddie and his daughter and but not before they discover what the secret password Orpheus was all about. What was Orpheus? What did that name mean? Because Batman, one of his last words to Selina was Orpheus. And it's referring to an Orpheus pit. A combination between the Lazarus pit and Bane Venom. And and it's in in a very... Chris, uh, pardon me, uh, Cliff Shang does a really good job drawing upon emotional moments in the past where it shows videotape of Alfred, where Batman utilized some of this Orpheus pit liquid to try to, to save Alfred's life. Uh, but the side effect is that it, it aged Alfred prematurely and he died of old age. And so this Orpheus pit, the combination of Lazarus pit and Bane venom ended up, it could save you and give you a lot of vitality, but you'd, it would greatly shorten your lifespan. And the, the, what added to the tragedy here is Batman by Batman get, encoding Selena's DNA to that Batarang, what he really wanted Selena to do was to get into the Batcave and to put his body in the Orpheus pit so he could come back and be Batman again, as opposed to being with her. So Batman, his obsession, he was obsessed with just being able to get a few more days of being Batman again, and maybe some time with Selena, but his first, his first priority always was Batman. And, and Selena comes to terms with that in this issue. So emotionally, this really was very well done by Cliff Shang. And this ends with her, of course, uh, be, uh, agreeing to work with Barbara Gordon, the new commissioner. And there's great scenes and rapport and dialogue between uh, between her and uh, between Selena and Commissioner uh, Commissioner Barbara Gordon. And Barbara Gordon let Selena in on a secret that the real reason why Batman was always able to sneak up on 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 Jim Gordon was because he he was deaf in in one ear, and so little moments like that stated in the dialogue I thought were really nicely done, and and if she ends up with uh, Edward Nigma and and so this was a really nice all the plot lines were resolved and uh, Selena has a new life and a, a new take on life moving forward and happiness with of all people uh, Edward Nigma so I thought it was I thought it was well done nothing I would say that is is super spectacular there's there's a real element to this this felt a little bit more real than a lot of batman related stories 
uh, but it did it did have some satisfaction and some emotional payoffs uh, in the end. Yeah, it did. Um, almost poignant, I would almost say. You know, in terms of yeah, this is an older an older Catwoman, and you know she she knows the end is a lot closer than the beginning. So uh, I I enjoyed that because she's always been somewhat of an arrogant character, you know, and so age has humbled her in a lot of ways. It's yes. the, the, you know, the one thing mortality is the one thing that none of us can, can beat. So, uh, all right. Up next, we have the Riddler year one. This is from writer Paul Dano. If you're not familiar, he's the one that played Riddler in the most recent Batman movie. St- uh, Stefan Subic is the artist letters are by Clayton Cowles. This is digitally painted with a really kind of sketchy, um, almost a watercolor color style. It suits the tone of the book really, really well, but I didn't really care for the art. Um, I didn't see the Batman movie. I, From what I've seen of that version of the Riddler, I don't find it, him to be particularly compelling or interesting. The whole mask with the glasses over the front of it, I, whatever. But if you enjoyed that movie and you want more of that version of the Riddler, then this is for you. Uh, I can't speak to how well this... Um, kind of portrays that characterization again, because I haven't seen it, but I'm assuming because it's the actor who's, you know, spent plenty of time playing uh, that Riddler uh, character and and inhabiting him that it probably does a pretty good job of that. But this sort of (laughs) just reiterated for me why I haven't seen the movie. It's just not a version of Batman or the Riddler that I really care to know anything about. So I'm not the best one to, to really, you know, make that comparison as far as this story itself, it's really cliched. Um, the, the pacing's well done. The art, even though I don't care for the style, is um, is solid in terms of visual storytelling. But yeah, there's nothing there's nothing new here. So again, certainly made for fans of that Batman movie, fans who like that version of the Riddler. I think you will enjoy this. But for anybody who's not a fan of those, you know that version of the character or that. Uh, that movie just to give you kind of an idea um yeah so we're talking about uh a genius who's probably on the spectrum you know he's probably got asperger's or some functioning level of autism and he can see patterns and numbers and he's really really smart but he doesn't go anywhere in life because he can't talk to people he's very nervous around people he doesn't have any social skills and he's being taken advantage of by his immediate supervisor who takes credit for his work basically so, you know, the most tropey and cliched of, um, of, you know, origins for this version of the Riddler. If you think that sounds interesting or you haven't read a story like that before, then, uh, and you're, you know, you're a fan <laughs> of, of this version of the Riddler, by all means dive in. Right. <laughs> but, but that's what this is. That, Tell us you how know, you really I, feel there, Jason. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying that's what this is which is a story that I personally have read or watched in another medium many, many, many times. So uh, yeah, there's, there's no new ground being broken here. So um, yeah, I, whatever. It it was a quick read. I'll say that a very easy read. Um, But yeah, it's kind of, this is utterly forgettable, honestly. So yeah, uh, I never, I just sort of skim, I, I did sort of skim read it. A little bit, but I didn't. I, not enough to really comment on it. I wasn't a fan of the Batman movie. If you want to talk about a rant, watch my review of the Batman movie. I, I, I rant to high heaven about it. I wasn't a fan of it. It was just too dark. Uh, we need, we need another dark Batman movie. Another Christopher Nolan like Batman movie. Like we need a hole in the head. Um, it's uh, and this is just more more to that. I just it just it never rang true for me and it's not uh but i mean it's true to the bat if you if you people love the riddler in the batman movie well this is certainly a would would i can highly recommend this then but like you said i mean if you're into that but i i just wasn't into the character i never i never i never bought into the character in the movie i thought it was a dumb character in the movie i didn't think it worked well in the movie and i never bought it for a second in the movie so uh, you know, but I mean, we're in the minority. I mean, it made, it made 700 or whatever, $700 million. So, uh, but, uh, if you want to see a superhero movie, go to black Adam, don't go to the Batman. Yeah. hundred percent. Uh, all right. Up next, we have Deathstroke incorporated number 14. This is from writer Ed Brisson art by Dexter soy colors by Veronica Gandini, uh, letters by Steve Wands. what do you think? 
I, you know, Ed Brisson, uh, we said uh, this is chapter five of Deathstroke Year One. You and I said when this, uh, when chapter one, when chapter one hit, like whatever four issues ago, we thought, geez, why, why are they wasting our time? Deathstroke, Deathstroke. Uh, Joshua Williamson was finishing his Deathstroke run, and then goes into Dark Crisis. I wanted maybe we were complaining maybe a little bit that why don't we get more of Deathstroke in Dark Crisis? Why go back and give us an origin we already know? But hey, man. I'll, I'll gladly, you know, my foot, insert my foot in my mouth. Ed Brisson, you've made a believer out of me, man. This this has been five chapters of entertainment fun. Uh, this is more exciting than the the original Deathstroke origin as far as I'm concerned. I'm loving this. Deathstroke is his central angster. He's, uh, Ed Brisson isn't afraid to make Deathstroke look like the a-hole that he is. He's a terrible father. He's a terrible person. He's not particularly likable. He's not supposed to be. And I'm, I'm glad he's written that way. Some characters I love to hate, or at least love to strongly dislike. And if I like them, and in and, and some characters I might enjoy liking precisely because they're jerks. <laughs> and that's Deathstroke. And this issue really ramps up, fires on all cylinders, because he's Deathstroke is finally, Deathstroke was killed. He was he decided he'd rather die by Green Arrow's hands than, than, than to fail in his mission. Uh, he was, he was uh, his healing factor healed him and he wants to complete the contract and kill Dr. Campbell, who is the doctor responsible for turning him into a soldier and killing and going through many other uh, soldiers uh, in order to perfect the perfect military human soldier weapon. And this is so action packed and De Deathstroke finally locates Dr. Campbell only to discover that three other assassins are there as well to, to take out this, this doctor who is guarded, heavily guarded by many, uh, well-skilled personnel. And of course we have these uh, three assassins that are extremely skilled, very good at what they do. And Deathstroke is just that, just a little bit better, just barely enough better than them. And the action, the, the choreography here, the great art by Dexter Soy and the, uh, the, the coloring, uh, all of it just, I mean, I, I, I was loving this. I love the dialogue. I love the rapport. I love the, the, what I expect from Deathstroke is his typical cockiness when he gets into a fight and kicks some ass. Uh, there's a lot of it here. And the, the, if you want to know the hardcore reality of how cold blooded Deathstroke can be at the end where, where Dr. Campbell's begging for his life and the ultimate fate of Dr. Campbell and, and, and Deathstroke's attitude toward everyone in this issue in terms of getting the job done. I mean, this issue is hardcore Deathstroke and that's what I like about it. And this, this, the fact that this is a year one Deathstroke tale, uh, Ed Brisson knew what the assignment was, you know, and you know, you don't, this can't be a story. It, it shouldn't be a story. And it isn't a story of Deathstroke, you know, showing his good side at the end of it or realizing and turning back and being nice. No, no, this is Deathstroke. This is why he became a major supervillain hitman to begin with. Uh, he was the best of, he's the best of the best for a reason. And that's because he's a cold hearted, he can be a cold hearted bastard. And that's what this displays. And it does so in visceral fashion, in, 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 with violence, with, with cocky dialogue, with the type of stuff that you expect in these types of displays. And, you know, this isn't Shakespeare people, obviously this is Deathstroke Incorporated. And I had a lot of fun reading this. What about you? Yeah, I agree. He's unlikable uh, for a reason. It's, it's this is the beginning of Deathstroke. It's yeah, we debated on whether or not it, it was necessary to to go over the origin of of Slade Wilson because we all kind of knew the story. Um, and it's not like Ed Brisson is telling us anything that we didn't already know. But the thing is, he's showing us the, the extent of it, right? Um, it, this is just fantastic. And, and the art by Dexter Soy is, is the perfect choice for this. Um, it, it's a little dark, it's a little visceral, and it kind of suits this narcissistic, you know, evil bastard that, uh, that Slade Wilson is, uh, you know, uh, we, we talked before about the kind of the, the hypocritical, you know, version of, of him in terms of, okay, uh, you, you say, and he says it here again, when he kills the doctor, you know, the doctor says, you know, it wasn't me. It was this other guy, Walsh, who, who, who made me do it. And he threatened my family, blah, blah, blah. Um, and Deathstroke kills him anyway and says, I gave my, you know, I, I took out the contract. I gave my word, whatever. I'm going to fulfill the means of my contract. 
Yet he does, he gave his word, he gave his oath, he gave his vow, whatever you want to call it, when he got married. But he's willing to abandon that. So, <laughs> yeah. um, again, There's it just no money it, in that. it doesn't make a whole. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that cost me money to, yeah, marriage to raise money, a yeah. family. So, yeah, so it's fantastic. I mean, we're 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 seeing the beginnings of this, you know, psychopath and uh, and understanding why he would do things like manipulate a, you know, 14 year old girl and, uh, you know, have her betray her friends and all that sort of thing, you know, evil crap like that, that he does. Well, this, this is why this is the beginnings of, of that. Um, but that being said, there is enough, um, context and trauma and, um, reasoning for him to take this path, right? We, we see him making the wrong choices and you sort of feel bad for him. We know that he was experimented on. It affected his brain and this, you know, uh, this craving that he has for violence, uh, for drama that that ex could extend. You could make the argument to, um, you know, dis domestic disputes with his his wife, just because he, you know, his 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 brain like chemically now just craves conflict. So, in a way, a little bit of a victim of circumstance. There's just enough of that that Ed Brisson brings in, um, so that you, in a way, you almost feel bad for Slate for his situation almost uh almost. but again he's he's <laughs> enough of a bastard and a hypocrite that you yeah you, you remember who he is uh Brisson reminds us that he's a, a piece of crap uh all right up next we have batman fortress number six this is from writer gary witta art is by uh derek robertson colors by diego rodriguez lettering by simon boland Again, this is just so much fun as Batman and the, the crew that he's put together, including President Lex Luthor, uh, Jackson Hyde, and uh, Red Arrow, are try and uh, Dale, uh, the Green Lantern that is uh, of the same race as Chip, kind of this chunk chipmunk type um, ra race of aliens, and they're trying to break into the Fortress of Solitude so they can get some Kryptonian tech to try to. Um, free the earth from these aliens that are, uh, that are attacking it. So th this issue is, is really fast paced and it's basically them breaking in and going through a series of traps, um, and trying to get to the other side. And as it's almost like, as they clear one trap, one person from the team is, is left behind or has to sacrifice themselves and that sort of thing. So really good pacing, a lot of fun. The art by Derek Robertson is fantastic. The coloring, you know, they're in the Fortress of Solitude, which is, you know, buried at the bottom of the ocean. So it, it's dark in color. It's dark in there, right? So uh, this is a lot of fun. Uh, it was over too quick in my mind. I immediately wanted the next issue as soon as I was done. I love the character interactions. Um, you know, this is a, a version of, um, of Batman and a, a version of the DCU that's outside of normal continuity. Um, and so it's not tied to any of that. And it, it does give... Uh, Gary Witta a chance to give us a little more um, a little more a hu of a humorous characterization, a little more of a wise ass Batman. Um, so uh, I enjoy that as well because there's usually one or one or two good, really good lines in here. Sometimes it's not even Batman. Sometimes it's uh, Dale or or uh, Amico even. So there's um, there's always one or two lines in here that get me laughing. But uh, but I'm I'm a big fan of the series. Um, I can't wait to see where it goes. And it's so, so strange too, right? Like starting off with this alien invasion and it feeling like this big book with the justice league. And, you know, we were wondering why it was called fortress and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's God, so much has happened in, in this series. It's only issue six. Like, uh, it's been really, um, really well paced because you never feel like anything is missed, but a lot has happened. Like these issues are jam packed with action and, uh, and meaningful events. So what did you think? Well, I, I agree. There's been a lot of twists and turns from the beginning, but I will say that if I'm, if I'm brutally honest, uh, each issue has been less enticing than the previous one. The best issue was the first one. And then the second was just a little less as, as interesting as for me. Uh, now having said that I'm still on board with this, uh, it's the oddest thing because this is a really, really, I, I would never in a million years have guessed that the, the big star team by the middle of this series or near the end of it would be Batman, Amico, some Green Lantern squirrel called Dale 
and and Lex Luthor in a in a Lex Luthor suit with the symbol of the president of the United States on it, and and it's a Lex Luthor that doesn't seem to be quite as intelligent as Batman. Batman is kind of a Batman doesn't seem to have. Um, there's no other heroes that he could choose from. Uh, it's it's odd that he has an entire world of heroes to choose from, and he chooses this group for this job. Now that's me playing script doctor, but then, but then I don't know what other heroes exist in this continuity in this world created by uh, uh, by uh, by Witta. But it's you you are right though. There's something about it that is intriguing. I mean, because there's there's a dialogue here. And there is a rapport here, and you you can you can kind of there's almost a fish out of water type of scenario where there's you, you, I don't know what the hell to expect because Batman is this is not this is not the Batman this doesn't think like the Batman as we're used to thinking about what is view of all these characters and interpretation of these characters is different it's not wrong it's his comic he can write these characters however he wants it is just different. And what what really adds that extra element of, of surprise is the fact is is Gary Robertson's uh pardon me uh, it's not Gary Robertson is it? it's a uh, is it Gary Robertson's art Derek Derek Robertson I always get that wrong Derek, Derek Robertson Robert. arts uh I mean because uh, on the one hand this feels like it's the boys that this feels like it's because it, because Derek Robertson drew the boys so this reminds me of that artistically and yet it's a Batman comic and but it is it. it it, it does, like you said, it is entertaining. It is entertaining. I'm surprised. There, there's some people that really don't enjoy this. But like you said, there is a fun element to it. Uh, my only caveat is that it's fun. I just, and maybe this is a good thing. I just, I just have no idea where this is going to go. I literally have no idea how this is going to resolve at all. I don't know where this is going. I don't know what happened to the, to the aliens that are looking for Superman. Where they're? I don't know why the Fortress of Solitude is at the bottom of the ocean. I don't know. I, I'm not even sure if I can remember why the hell they're in the Fortress of Solitude. They're looking for something that the aliens might be looking for. Uh, it's crazy. And you got the president of the United States, Lex Luthor, in a crazy looking presidential suit, helping Batman out and kind of being a jerk while he's doing it. And, a, and a, again, a Green Lantern squirrel named Dale. I mean, this in, in many ways, this is almost like a modern day Silver Age tale uh, with modern day sensibilities. And so uh, kudos for Witta for making me shake my head. But uh, as I do so, I have a I have a shit eating grin on my face. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I have no idea where it's going either, but uh, that's part of the fun. Uh, all right, up next we have DC Mech number four from writer Kenny Porter. Baltimore Revis is the artist. Mike Spicer on colors. Tam, Tom Napolitano on letters. So this is going to seem like a little bit of a backhanded compliment, but this was my favorite issue of the series so far. Um, but this one had the least amount of mechs and kind of weird random characterization and nonsense in it. Um I haven't liked that. I haven't liked the characterization of Batman and Superman that we've had in here, or maybe I should say Bruce and, and Cal. Um, and I, I'm not a particular fan of putting these heroes in mechs that have the superpowers as opposed to the, the characters themselves, um, whether that be Jon Stewart or Diana Prince or, or Wally West or whomever. So the fact that we didn't get hardly any of that, and this is a more pedestrian issue with, some actual characterization for these characters that felt a little more true to who they, who I see them as. Um, again, and maybe it's a little bit of a backhanded compliment. All that being said, I still don't think this is a, it's certainly not a, a series that I'm going to pick up in, uh, in a physical copy and I'm going to read. And it's not one that I can really recommend. Um, I spent quite a bit of time thinking about this on my drive home tonight um, about like, who is this comic for? Like, who do I think would pick it up um, and enjoy it? And could this be a gateway book into the DCU for somebody? And I suppose that's possible. I mean, the Baldemar Rivas art, it definitely has kind of a manga influence. Um, and somebody that's maybe a fan of like Robotech or Transformers or something like that, maybe this is pulling them in. I'm not, I'm not really sure. But uh, there is one of the covers that gives kind of a close-up blueprint type look uh for the flash mech which is kind of interesting um but i haven't really heard anybody talking about this i haven't really seen dc marketing this so i i, I just don't know I, I this is a strange book in my mind and 
definitely not something that's going to stick with me or that I'm going to go back and, and reread. So um, this, this issue was average as be- at best, but again, that's, <laughs> I don't know what that says about the series that the best one so far has been average. Cause in my mind, the, the previous ones have been sub subpar below average. So anyway, um, yeah. it is well, what it is. Uh, I, I, I don't add, know if you got a chance to, to check it out or not. Well, I, I would just add the comment. Uh, no, I didn't. I, I haven't. I'll just add the comment that this is along the lines of Jurassic league where you got the justice league that are dinosaurs in here. You got the justice league that are essentially transformers. And so, you know, to the extent that there's a market for that or an audience for that, you know, they're checking it out. They made it a, they've made it a, a six issue miniseries and they, they're floating it. See how it responds, see how the readership responds. And I, you know, I guess, you know, sales will determine what, what they're doing moving forward. I do find it interesting that Jurassic league, which deals with, you know, their dinosaurs, uh, that, that they're going to be at least, I, I believe they're getting their own universe at some point in the DC universe with the DC universe, big bang coming out the one shot by Mark Wade. Perhaps there's even going to be a reference by, to DC Mac. Who knows? But, uh, you know, clearly I think they're trying to, you know, cater to different, uh, what they see as potentially different demographics. But we shall see. Yeah. Again, we'll we'll see. Uh, all right. Up next, we have DC versus Vampires, number 10 of 12, written by James Tynan and Matthew Rosenberg. Art and colors are by Otto Schmidt. Letters by Tom Napolitano. Getting down, only a couple issues left of this. What do you think? Uh this is really ramping up. I really enjoy this issue. Uh, first, I, I I love the cover here by uh, Gilliam March. Uh, it has uh, it has it looks like Barbara Gordon and the Huntress are on the. Uh, that, actually, that might be Batwoman. I'm not sure if that's. I think that's. I think that's Batgirl. Is that Batgirl or Batwoman on the cover with the Huntress? But in any event, it's it's a gorgeous looking main cover. There's the alternate cover with uh, Supergirl. She's smiling and looks gorgeous, but she's covered in blood and cuts and everything else. And then there's a zombie cover uh, with, I'm not even sure who the hell the character is, but. You that's know, Nightwing. That's, that's Nightwing? Oh, yes. King of the Vampires, Nightwing. Yes. Uh, but uh, there's a lot that happens in this issue. And a lot, we, it is revealed here that some of the characters we thought were previously killed are, in fact, still alive. Uh, we come across Gotham. Damien is trying to sneak in Black Canary, Batgirl, and Harley Quinn into Gotham City so that Batgirl can get her revenge and she wants to kill Nightwing. And there's a lot, there's a lot of interesting things that happen there. Uh, uh, in, in DC Vampire's All Out War, Damien sent Batwoman in to get Starfire and they utilize Starfire to good effect because Starfire takes out Black Adam in this issue. And Kate, for those of you who are wondering who would win in a battle, uh, to answer a question no one asked, but you should, because it's kind of cool. Who would win, Starfire or Black Adam? Well, Starfire wins rather handily, and uh, takes out um, takes out uh, Black Adam, uh, which opens up, allows them to sneak into uh, Gotham City, where uh, in in a very very interesting and and uh, interesting manner, the the plan once they get in once they get into Gotham. What I I love what uh, James Tynion and Matthew Rosenberg do here is, you know, for 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 once, it's not Damien that has the master plan. It's actually Barbara Gordon because she's a pretty damn good thinker too, and she utilize she changes the she's been planning for many many months now with other members of the Batman family to utilize the bat signal as a as a UV light and to all the other members of the bat family. Uh, uh, namely, you know, the Huntress, Cassandra Cain, uh, Clown Hunter, uh, uh, the Signal, uh, M- Mr. Freeze, uh, Mother Panic. I mean, there's all these other characters and heroes that are that are uh, are still human, and they utilize the UV lights because they got various bat signals throughout the city, and they're taking the war to Dick Grayson, who is the king of the vampires. And that's taking place in Gotham City. Meanwhile, in Australia, Supergirl finally makes it ashore. It's revealed that Jaina, the Wonder Twin, was in fact not killed. We thought that Aquaman had killed Jaina because when she turned into water. But in fact, what she did, she turned into water, went into Supergirl Kara's lungs. And so when what we thought was Supergirl dying last issue was actually Jaina filling Kara's lungs with, with water and then making sure that Kara got oxygen uh, and ultimately rescuing Kara to bring her up on the shores of Australia, uh, where they will ultimately, uh, I believe, try to bring Kara to sunlight. 
and uh, to power up power up Kara. Meanwhile, we got uh, it within Gotham City. We got uh, Punchline uh, makes a deal with uh, uh, they make a deal with with Punchline, uh, who uh, who Punchline actually captures Harley Quinn and uh, Black Canary and Batwoman and Damien, and she she'll only let them go if if Bat Batgirl agrees to kill. A certain person that she won't mention. Batgirl refuses to kill. The only person Batgirl wants to kill is uh, Nightwing. It's ultimate, but but along comes Damien, and he's got no problem killing the person that Punchline wants dead, and that's Two Face. So he ends up dying. So there's it's there, there's some good characterizations here. You know, Batgirl won't kill, but yet you know, give it to Damien. He's a vampire. Damien would kill in the best of times, even when he was human. Uh, at least the old Damien would, and so. I love the characterizations here and the jokes and the rapport. And there's, there's, there's again, uh, Matthew Rosenberg and James Tiny, and they know these characters. They handle them very well. Matthew Rosenberg continues to improve. I'm not sure how they split up the, uh, the writing chores on this, but they work together well as a team here. There's a great scene with Green Arrow uh, in Smallville who lets himself be, be captured. Uh, he speaks with Hawkman. He tries to get Hawkman to come back to the side of the humans, uh, but he... Uh, of course, he doesn't expect Hawkman to agree, so he's in prison, and he ends up talking to Grifter. And there's a, there's a hilarious scene where they're basically he gets Grifter to, to piss on the ground with him, and they're pissing on the ground to create moisture so that Swamp Thing can come up out of the ground and help them in their battle against Hawkman and the vampires. We will never there. speak of this. Yeah, <laughs> we will never speak of this again, yeah. Grifter says, I'll be happy to help you, and then, he, you know... Green Arrow and does his fly, and Grifter says, "I take that back. I don't want to help you." <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, there's there's some good scenes here. Uh, I mean, a lot of fun, a lot of action. There's there's consequences, and yeah, this is something where people are going to want to pick this up. Uh, this DC Vampires has been all out war with its uh, color palette, with the with the black black, white, and red has been uh, visually has been somewhat of a a. a a chore for me to look at, but story-wise, a lot has happened there. And this is an action-packed, plot-driven series where there's consequences, and it's you know it's going to be interesting to see. I'm I'm still debating whether or not I'm going to be getting this as a trade, but if if this if they nail the landing on this, because this is a really good issue. This is one of my favorite issues so far, and I thought they did a pretty good job here uh, in handling this issue. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I wasn't as excited about it as you. Um, I'm just sort of over this storyline, and I'm ready for it to kind of wrap up and see what's what's happening. There were some great moments in this. The Black Adam moment, the interaction between Grifter and Green Arrow that you touched on, and the humor with Swamp Thing. Um, that being said, like, there's not much... It, this was more about, okay, let's get these characters in place for the kind of the final battle, if you will. Uh, which I guess is going to be a confrontation between Barbara and, and Dick, which, you know, I still wonder about that choice. We talked about it right from the beginning when it was revealed that uh, Dick Grayson is the king of the vampires. So, yeah, this was just this was OK uh, for me. Um, I'm ready to to kind of get to the final act. And that, that, it, it seems like that's what this issue is in preparation for. Uh, what I did love about the issue was the art by Otto Schmidt. Uh, we've talked in the past about how the art, on some of the issues has felt rushed. Um, to me, this is a return to Otto at his best. Didn't feel rushed. It felt like he had the ability to take his time. Really rich colors that really showcase his artwork. Um, so yeah, that, to me, that was a step back in the right direction because I'm such a fan of his. So to have those few issues where the art felt like it was rushed and, and wasn't up to his usual standards was, was a bit disappointing for me. Um, and I don't know if, if that's actually the case or if he was, you know, doing it purposefully, if he was uh, giving us some, uh, you know, a sketchier and a loose, looser style on purpose because he was trying to show that the world's falling apart or or some other reason that he chose to do that. I'm, I'm not really sure, but um, the fact that he colors his own line work and, and the colors here are so much richer in my mind. I feel like he just had more time for this particular issue. So that, that may or may not be the case, but uh, all right. Up next, we have detective comics number 1065 from writer Rom V 
Raphael Albuquerque is the artist, Dave Stewart on colors, Ariana Mare on letters, Evan Cagle doing the cover, which these kind of gothic covers are really, really interesting. And I, I like that, you know, thematically they have all, they all have the kind of the same frame on them and they, they look very similar in terms of style. I, I really like that. Uh, I think it suits the aesthetic. Uh, there is a Jim Lee variant cover, which right away you can tell that it's Jim Lee. Uh, and then the, a Martin Simmons one in 25 also. Um, as far as the story, yeah, this is more of the same for me in terms of how I feel about this story. It's a, it's a little dark, it's a little overwrought, and it's almost like Batman is a supporting character in this larger story of Gotham City itself, which could be interesting, but I don't necessarily buy Detective Comics to read a story about Gotham City itself. I buy Detective Comics to read about Batman. And yeah, he doesn't seem, at least so far, he doesn't seem to be the main character in his own story. Um, but that being said, with what we're learning about the Oregon family and kind of their, their machinations, uh, again, it's not the most original idea having somebody, some other family, some other group, some other secret society, some other individual, whatever it might be, all of a sudden we find out, oh, they're linked to the the, you know, the past of Gotham. I mean, this is not new. It's super tropey and super cliched. That being said, Ram V is a very talented writer and he's, he's making this interesting. This is the first issue of his run where I felt like engaged and interested. And uh, I felt a little compelled to read the, the next issue. Uh, and, and it does have to do with kind of the way this Oregon family is, is pulling the strings, you know, that, they, they go to the executor of the state of Arkham. We know the Arkham Asylum is shut down. And he's like, well, we're not going to sell this land. It's too valuable. And the guy's like, no, you misunderstand me. I'm paying you off to go away. I don't need to buy it from you. We already own it. We have the deed. I know you're going to fight it in court, blah, blah, blah. You will eventually lose. Here's money to just go away. I just find that to be interesting. They're so self-assured, um, which makes them seem very formidable. So uh, I am enjoying that. Uh, and I think part of the reason that I, I also enjoyed this issue more than previous, this issue had the less, the least amount of kind of supernatural sort of spirituality, dark Gothic sort of feel um, that we've had so far. And that's, that's the part that doesn't really work for me very well. Um, I, we talked, we've talked about it a lot recently with different, series that we've covered that deal with magic in the DCU, how it's not really my favorite corner of the, the DCU. So with that a little more in the background, this issue, maybe that's another reason why I, I enjoyed it more than previous. The art's fantastic too, by Raphael Albuquerque. Um, but it's a, again, it's a cleaner style than we've had from him in quite some time, even on previous issues of this run. So uh, what do you think of it? Yeah, I enjoyed it. I've, I've been enjoying it from the beginning. I, and it's, it's it's Ram V at his it's Ram V is also is is usually pretty big on exposition and he's pretty big on some sort of higher concepts and sometimes he gets a little bit uh, convoluted. I gotta let me kiss my daughter good night here. Yeah, he definitely can. His stories can be overwrought, <laughs> overworked. Yeah, but uh, what what aspects of it that I liked? I like the fact that uh, it was revealed. I I didn't really realize this before. It's not a big deal that apparently uh, Arkham Asylum is actually owned. Arkham Asylum and many other properties in, in Gotham are, are under a Arkham Trust. Uh, it's interesting that they're they're making an offer that this that this uh, Orgham family is making an offer to Mr. this Mr. Cummings, who is the executor of the trust. Um, I mean, it's, you know, not that anybody cares, but I mean, I, I do know a little thing about a little bit about trusts and you, you, you can't overcome a trust by buying off an executor. Executor doesn't have the power to do that. That's not what an exec, an executor has to honor the terms of the trust. So it doesn't work that way. But I mean, I suppose if, uh, you know, Ram V can write whatever he wants. Uh, the, the, the purpose of this was to show that the organs are willing. Money is no object. They just want to pay. They, they want to own the property because they have plans for Arkham Asylum. Uh, uh, Talia, uh, a, a well-known member of the of our, of uh, Razagul's family is Talia, and her her sort of first in charge or her first soldier is uh, Mr. Ubu. He Ubu, Ubu 
has appeared in many Batman tales. He ends up losing his life, being killed by this one of the Orgum characters, this uh, this uh, Gail Tenclaw character, ends up uh, what I believe taking his life at the end of this uh, at the end of this comic, and um, Batman himself is gr grievously injured. We have to remember that when the Orgams they're coming to Gotham to to make a power play in Gotham. And they knew that they were going to be attacked by Talia and the League of Assassins. And they utilized that as a, uh, by making themselves look like the victim, that they were attacked by the League of Assassins. They, oh, they survived the attack from the League of Assassins by, because they, they were expecting it. And they, often, they, they also managed to severely injure Batman with, uh, with Jim Gordon and Jim Gordon's new, I guess, sidekick from... I guess from the backup features of the previous three issues are with him. I can't remember his that the Jim Gordon's friend's name, uh, but they they actually uh, Jim Gordon they they, he, they they take Batman to help him out, and Jim Gordon even puts bandages around Bruce Wayne's uh, Bruce Wayne's um, head because he doesn't he doesn't want to know who Batman is, even though he suspects he knows who Batman is. He doesn't want to actually do that. He wants to honor it. And he wants to honor Batman, and he knows it would just make Batman uncomfortable if Batman thought he knew who he was. And so he's continuing to play that sort of that game with uh, with Batman. So uh, they right now this is just the Arkham's making a power play in Gotham, and we're, I'm still not sure where this is going. I'm sure there is going to be more uh, supernatural stuff. I know the stuff that you don't like, but I've there's hints of that in this story that in this issue that it's going to continue that way, and we'll have to see. So. Um, yeah, all in all, it's you know uh, he's I'm still on board. Uh, it's still, it's all going to come down to how does he nail the landing, and in particular, how where is Two Face fall in all of this? Because Two Face is being manipulated as well, but and Two Face, the evil side of Harvey Dent, is overcoming the the good side of Harvey Dent. So Two Face is the wild card in this story, and I suspect that this might end up being a two uh, a Two Face story uh, after all, despite the fact that we have this new family in Gotham. So. Yeah, and we get we get Two Face in the backup um, by Simon Spurrier. Hayden Sherman is the artist. Nick Filardi on colors and Steve Wands on letters. And I gotta I gotta admit that it seems like it's a story of Two Face fighting against kind of his his evil side, like manifested, like yeah. like a humanoid version of his his evil side. I guess I. I have to admit that I, I read it twice and I didn't get it at all. I, I don't know. Maybe you can. Yeah, it's like me. it's like. Well, no, I I didn't. Well, I mean, I think we both got it. Like this, he seems to be imagining the scar side of his face. The scars form a separate creature. He hallucinates a, a separate creature that is made from the scars on the scarred side of his face, and it's it's sort of a new way. So it's just another way to imagine the the inner psychological battle between Harvey Dent and Two Face. This one just has literally, it just literally has the scars themselves being its own monster, so to speak. Um, I I wasn't like narratively. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it was absolutely necessary for the main tale, uh, because I think I th I think it's obvious from Ram V's uh, Ram V's story that we we know that Two Face is having this you know, his, his usual battle between his darker and lighter halves. And so I'm not sure Simon Spurrier, I, I'm not sure if this is going to be linked into the main story, but Simon Spurrier's original story with Jim Gordon and his, where he ends up with this new partner uh, or sidekick, he's incorporated in Ram V's story. So maybe this, a few issues down the road, will play into Ram V's main story as well. I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm not, there's really not much to say about it. You know, I mean, it's just once again Two Face coming into terms with the fact that he's got a darker and a light side. So I don't know. Yeah, I, again, not much to yeah. it. Uh, all right, up next we have Harley Quinn number twenty-three. Who killed Harley Quinn? Chapter number two. <coughs> Excuse me, from writer Stephanie Phillips. Art is by Matteo Loli. Colors by Rain Barreto. Letters by Andrew Design. I, I'm loving the art on Harley these days uh, by Matteo Loli. It's wor really working for me. Um, and the colors by uh, Rain Barreto, I think, are also d done very, very well. I was a bit confused when this one starts off because we see Harley in a coffin, um, and she <laughs> looks 
she looks very beautiful. She looks like, you know, Harley, uh, as opposed to the last time we saw her, she had come up out of the Lazarus pit and she looked maniacal and crazy. And so like, Hey, what's going on? So as you read through the story, um, you find out that, yeah, it's, it's sort of a, a fake funeral and she's got these followers now, uh, that are kind of dressed like in Harlequin costumes and like what exactly is going on. And then Kevin shows up and he's like, what the hell is this? And she's like, well, I know what it looks like. It looks like I'm a cult leader that was raised from the dead. And well, I guess you're right. <laughs> you're pretty spot on. If that's what you think, this is the quintessentials, which apparently she started <laughs> this cult. And that's a good name. That's a good name. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And, and Kevin's like, dude, what he's, can I talk to you in a second? He's like, what is going on? And she talks to him and she seems like her normal self in a lot of ways, maybe even, maybe even less of the zany Harley and more kind of grounded. Um, and Kevin's like, you know, they, they told me, you know, he explains how he took her to a Lazarus pit and got her revived and everything, but explains to her that the, the, there might be side effects. And she's like, no, I feel, I feel normal, maybe a little gassy, but that's not really new. And, um, <laughs> and then Damien shows up and he, you know, he's got his own suspicions because obviously he knows about the Lazarus pits and the recent developments with them. And there's a big fight between him and Harley and Kevin tries to get involved. And of course, Kevin gets his butt kicked by Damien. And then, um, Harley and Damien sort of come to an understanding and, um, and Damien's like, okay, uh, I'm glad you're okay. But if you start feeling weird, you should tell someone and he leaves. And then we see whoever it was that killed Harley uh, in the hood, torturing one of her quintessentials, one of her followers trying to find out how Harley Quinn's alive. The guy obviously doesn't know. So this evil guy in the cape basically kills him pretty brutal. It looks like he might have some sort of lightning powers. So I, I have absolutely no idea who this guy might be. You know, yeah. he's all covered in this cloak, this hooded cloak, and we don't see anything other than a hand, but the, even that hand is wrapped in bandages. So no way to know who, uh, who it is. But at the end we see Harley and she's talking about how Gotham probably misses the old her so much, you know, the evil or not the evil, but the, the super villainous Harley. Yeah. Um, and she says, ah, we should give the people what they want. And again, gorgeous art here by Matteo Loli. Like the, the look on her face, you, it really is more of a, an evil looking Harley. And that's the thing, like, right. Even back in the day, Harley, yeah, she was a villain, but she was kind of zany and diabolical and, and more, more crazy, um, more chaotic than, than outright evil or malevolent, but just the look on her face and the tone, um, of the uh, scripting, the tone of the dialogue that Stephanie Phillip gives her, it, this is like a, a a more evil, a more malevolent type Harley. So I find that to be interesting. Yeah. What might be coming? I agree. Um, yeah. I find it to be and I also, more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I was never a fan. Like the reason I didn't like Harley was the whole zany craziness stu stuff. I yeah. just I don't go in for that. But well, I mean, obviously she's not going to stay villainous. We know because she's just too important of a character in terms of DC's bottom line. But the other thing that's interesting is the, I can't remember his, his name, um, the alien that was disguised as a cat. I can't remember. Oh, anyway. Jack star or, or no, no, no. The, the alien in this, the, the alien that's at the, on oh. sitting on top of the chair. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Oh, I forget. You even made a joke about. Yeah, I know about, the name. The name was. Uh, yeah, I'll have to look it up. But anyway, yeah. uh, what role he might still have to play because he seems to be going along with this new evil version of uh, of Harley. So anyway, what did you think? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I just I like again. Now, I will say as a maybe as a potential criticism, not much happens in this issue. It was really we didn't need Damien showing up. There, that was completely unnecessary. All we needed to know, I would have. This issue, in many ways, I, I would have liked this issue where where Harley was just evil, more evil from the beginning and have, have Kevin just reflect on past events on how more and more evil or more and more devilish Harley Quinn has become instead of her just being her same self for the entire issue except for the final page. Well, you, you really missed an opportunity and why? Just to show us Damian Wayne? And, and, and arguably Damien was, well, I, I would say, I don't even know how Damien has time to even show up in this issue, given where we know where Damien is. This is obviously before the Demonessa shows up. But in any event, um, I, I would have, uh, I like the developments here. I like Stephanie Phillips. I, I, I want Stephanie Phillips to uh, take this and to 
Have some fun with this. Give us an evil Harley Quinn channel. I mean, remember, Harley could be a cold-blooded killer when she wanted to be. Now, I, I while I suspect she's, Stephanie Phillips is not going to make her a cold-blooded killer and go to that extreme, uh, remember that that's certainly a, that's a legitimate interpretation of Harley Quinn because she has been that before. And make her very, very naughty. And guess what? Uh, he, here's me, here's a hot take. I say that sarcastically. A big hot take here is, remember that Harley Quinn doesn't have to be funny. She can just be a bitch. I mean, I mean that's a that's a take. Just have her do something really, really that uh, bad. I mean, ha have her rock the boat. Have her piss somebody off. Have her have her do something that isn't funny at all, and have people look at her. And that that would rock the boat. That gets attention. And because we, we've gotten relentless Harley Quinn, quirky, 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 sense of humor, quirky. Uh, let's go kiss. Let's go kiss uh, uh, Poison Ivy and then be jerky and quirky again and then throw the hammer. So, I mean, come on. She can be a very, uh, very evil bitch. So don't be afraid to write her like one. And, you can, and she can still be likable because, let's face it, men like bitches too. That's a fact. And uh, don't be afraid to play with that. I mean, the, the lack of, and this, this isn't a criticism, this is a criticism of all the Harley Quinn writers, is that the, they, they've stuck with that Amanda uh, Connor, uh, Jimmy Palmiotti idea of Harley Quinn, trying to recapture the magic that Palmiotti and, and Connor had. And that's, while that's a noble pursuit, Remember that there's many different iterations of Harley that that there are many fans of as well. So don't ignore them. And so I really like Stephanie Phillips doing this. I think she's on the right track, even if it might only be for a couple of issues. Yeah, the alien's name's Perry, right? Perry. Because he was a parasitic alien. So oh, she named him Perry. <laughs> right, Perry. Uh, yeah, so I, I looked that up real quick. So, uh, All right, on to the last book we're going to talk about in detail, The Human Target. This is issue number eight from writer Tom King. Art by Greg Smallwood, letters by Clayton Cowles. Uh, we have some fantastic covers, uh, regular cover by Greg Smallwood, and then a variant by Jorge Jimenez, and a 1 in 25 by uh, by Ryan Sook. Uh, what do you think of this? I Look, I've, I've, been, uh, I've been enjoying every issue of this series. I've been, uh, and this, this one is no exception, although this is going to sound, uh, this might sound a little bit sort of, odd but this is actually one where i actually think um this was probably out of all eight issues my least favorite issue only because it, this really felt like filler although but but it's interesting and really it's just uh, i'm very forgiving of it because number one the greg small words art and number two it actually made sense this is christopher chance waking up beside the gorgeous ice and uh, he ends up being uh, basically kidnapped for an entire day by Rocket Red of all people showed up. Another former member of the of the uh, Inter uh, Justice League International, he shows up, and he's basically investigating the disappearance of Guy Gardner. And he rightly concludes or believes and suspects that Christopher Chance has something to do. He thinks maybe something happened to Guy Gardner because he can't find him. And the entire issue it. It just really consists of Rocket Red basically beating the hell out of Christopher Chance, knocking him out. Christopher Chance wakes up and he's it's the whole issue is one giant interrogation scene of Rocket Red, you know, interrogating Christopher Chance and Christopher Chance uh, basically antagonizing him, being a smart ass, basically telling him where to go. Uh, and Rocket Red tries to do everything he can to try to entice uh, Christopher Chance, even dropping him from high up in the air. But Christopher Chance, the bottom line is he's not afraid to die. He he's dying, and uh, what? And at the end, it's just uh, all Ice does is Ice somehow somebody uh, somebody contacts Rocket Red with Guy Gardner's communicator, and Rocket Red is Rocket Red is led to believe at the end that Guy Gardner is off in an adventure in space, and. Now, we don't know how that's possible. I suspect ICE has something to do with it. But uh, clearly, we know that Guy Gardner is dead. The readers know that Guy Gardner is dead. Somebody has manipulated Rocket Red into believing that Guy Gardner is not alive. By the end of this issue, it's safe to assume that it's probably ICE. 
because Ice probably always had that com- a way of communicating with Guy. And so she basically ends up saving Christopher Chance at the end. And Christopher Chance is very frustrated because he loses an entire day because he's only has 12, 12 days to live. And he's lost an entire day of being tortured by Rocket Red. And he's so frustrated at the end, he just knocks out Rocket Red and probably would have killed Rocket Red if Ice wouldn't have stopped him. But uh, I didn't feel that this issue had as much resonance or an emotional impact as past issues. This was uh, this was just one long interrogation scene that was, I thought, sort of like, I did feel that this was padded. So I, I never quite felt that this had the gravitas of, of any of the previous issues, including the one shot. But I still enjoyed it, and it's still in keeping with the character, and it just highlights the fact of how important it is that he make the most out of his 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 last few days, and he wants to spend them, frankly, making love with a beautiful woman named Ice. So, what do you think? Yeah, I sort I sort of agree with you. I mean, this was still fun, and it's still gorgeous, Greg Smallwood art. But what really w- was kind of um, driven home in this issue was the fact that the the mystery has been solved. Right. Like that was the whole idea when he first found out that he was poisoned was that he was going to solve the mystery of, of who killed him, um, you know, in, in trying to kill Lex Luthor, who, who killed, who actually ended up killing Christopher Chance or condemning him to death. If you want to think of it that way, because he did have, you know, 12 days to live or whatever. So, you know, that that's that's fun. That's interesting for a series. But this is issue eight. So we've got eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. We've got you know, basically five issues after the mystery has been solved. And what are you going to do with those issues? Well, okay. Rocket Red was pretty good friends with Guy Gardner. So it makes sense that he would go searching for him. Uh, I, I did like that Tom King reminded us that, Hey, Rocket Red is not just some dumb, dumb Russian in armor. You know, he's a scientist. He's the one that built that. He searches earth, all of earth for Guy's signature uh, energy. Can't find it. He searches around earth. He knows that Guy didn't leave earth. He's not off in space somewhere. So he knows guy was angry with Christopher chance. So how, you know, how can it be? Uh, and then, yeah, I somehow manipulates events to make it where guy went, traveled to another dimension, you know, and, and, uh, was a, they were able to contact rocket red with guy's voice to tell him that, and he'll be back soon and, and what have you. So, okay. So that, that, that worked. People are suspicious, but they've ice and Christopher chance have sort of you, you know, allayed their suspicions and, you know, kind of thrown off the, thrown everybody off the scent. There's a alibi, if you will, or a, a you know, a, a reason why no one has seen guy. So that leaves four, we still have four issues to go, nine, 10, 11, 12. Like what's, what's left, you know, other than are, are you going to try to find a way to save Christopher chance? Is that, is that what's going to happen? Like, I, I have no idea what to expect now. So that's not a bad thing. Um, but this, just based on what happened in this issue, that we're reminded that Christopher Chance has sort of achieved his his bucket list item. Um, what now? So I'm still fully on board. I would be fully on board just if Christopher Chance, you know, walks around the DCU and says bye to everybody. If it's with this gorgeous Greg Smallwood art, I'm still I'm still on board with that. Uh, but I I don't I don't know what to expect. So that, in a way, that's kind of fun. That's kind of fun that we yeah. don't know what to uh, what to expect. So yeah, no, it's good. I, I'm anyway, so excited. that's it for. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say I I, I agree with you. It's it's a, it's this is still a fun series. It's still a fun series. Yeah, exactly. So that does it for um, the single issues that come out this week. Other than uh, Young Justice Targets number four, which is also out this week. I sort of wanted to, to read the first three. I don't, again, I, I'm not sure. We must not have been sent the very first issue because I don't ever remember seeing it. And then uh, when we saw subsequent issues, I just assumed it was a digital first series because I don't ever remember seeing the the first issue. So I was going to try to find the first three issues and read them so then I could talk about four, but I just didn't have time based on the, the number of books that we had this week. Uh, but it's by Greg Wiseman, who uh, has written for DC Animated before, as well as, I think, uh, on some of the CW shows. So maybe I'll get a chance to get caught up on that. Uh, it is a limited series. I don't know how many issues, though. So uh, anyway, in addition to that, there are some collections as well. The Joker, Volume 1 Trade Paperback, which uh, we were big fans of that series. It's not about the Joker. It's actually about Jim Gordon. We do recommend it. Uh, the Justice League Incarnate has uh, a hardcover. And that's the miniseries from Joshua Williamson that 
was part of the prelude up to Dark Crisis. Harley Quinn, the current volume, volume has its second volume, uh, volume two, Keepsake. Uh, it has that out today. That's by writer Stephanie Phillips and artist Riley Rosmo. And then the, the final vampire, uh, American Vampire 1976, the final American Vampire series by Scott Snyder and Raphael Albuquerque has its um, final trade paperback out today as well. So uh, that does it for this episode. Well, I just we have to, I want to know your uh, was, pick of the week. Yeah, I was going to say, other than just... To say, yeah, what was your... My, mine is DCV Vampires. Really? Yeah, my not... issue 10. That was my favorite of the week. It's I not Human Target not... this time. I was Human Target was, was just, I thought it was a little boring. And he, DC Vampires just had all the action that I loved this week. So what about yourself? Uh, you know, I think I got to go with Tim Drake. No, uh, <laughs> I think I think I, I actually have to go with Oh man, that's tough. It's a toss up between Batman Beyond, which I thought was really, really good this week, and the Catwoman Lonely City. And I think it would I think if it weren't for the delay, that Catwoman Lonely City would have been been my pick. So I, I don't necessarily put that on Cliff Chang. So I'm gonna go with Catwoman Lonely City. Um that was a very satisfying wrap up to that series. So I'm I'm going that's with good. that. Right on. I think that's a that's a noble that's a, that's a that's a good choice. That 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 was good and it's it's not anybody's fault maybe that it got delayed, but uh, hopefully it'll come out as a hardcover. That DC's always putting them out as hardcover, so that should be pretty decent. Yeah, and don't forget, everybody, go listen to our thoughts on Black Adam. Um, the first half of the episode just talks about Black Adam in general and what you might want to read to help you prepare to go see the movie or what to read after if you've seen the movie and you're looking for more Black Adam. So there's not really any spoilers for the movie in the first half of our episode, but in the second half, we'll give you plenty of warning we get into details and um, characterization and story points in, in the film. So if you don't want it to be spoiled, go watch the movie first and then come back and listen to our episode. So uh, that's going to do it for this episode. Uh, anything else you want to tease or uh, plug before we uh, sign well, off? Well, I'm a little behind on my indie review this past week. Uh, I know Jim was tied up and I, I said I would do a review, so I'll, I'll probably still have a review indie review this week coming out. And beyond that, uh, I did do a, I, I got, I, I did get the absolute, I did a review of the absolute edition of uh, Doomsday Clock, which isn't showing up on the green screen here because yellow on a green screen always looks a little bit wonky, but it's a, you know, if you can get the Doomsday Clock uh, uh, Omnibus, I would recommend you can get it. I, it's a little pricey, so try to get it on sale from your retailer if you can. But it's got a bunch, a lot of Easter eggs. I, I hope that the, the, the fluidity and the, and the poet, poetic nature of which Jeff Johns sort of creates the metaverse at the end of Doomsday Clock, I wish was the template for the DC Universe moving forward. And I think it still might be. The jury is still out on that. We don't know uh, what the what the DC universe is going to feel like post dark crisis. Uh, but anyways, I, regardless, I love doomsday clock. I love Jeff Johns and uh, Gary Frank and Brad Anderson, creative team, hell of a creative team. Uh, and it's just amazing. Doomsday clock took way too long, almost well over two, like almost two years to come out. It's insane, oh, yeah. Yeah. but it's, it, it was, dare I say, was it worth the wait? Yes, it was worth the wait, but boy, I think if it have, if it had come out on time, I think it may have had. If DC didn't have all those editorial shenanigans and the buyouts and all that other jazz, what what could have been is all I can think about. But yeah, the DC universe had that book come out on a monthly basis, uh, and Jeff Johns, well, and again, this is his choice to focus. He went to film school, and that's where he wants his focus to be on movie and TV. But if he was still pursuing, you know comics with the same fervor as he has in the past, the entire DC universe would look very different. Yeah. Uh, and even if he wasn't able to dedicate the time, if we just would have had that series come out on time, the DC universe would look much, much different, but uh, we are getting some payoff and hints from some of the seeds and things planted uh, in that series yeah. that paid off in flashpoint beyond and are hinted at, you know, more to come in his golden age series and his justice society series. We saw that, at the end of Flashpoint Beyond that we talked about uh, last week. So yeah. anyway, yeah, that's going to do it, everybody. Appreciate you joining us as always. Don't forget to head over to YouTube. If you're listening to the audio only version, do a search for Rocky's channel. It's comic space, boom, exclamation point. Subscribe, like this video, comment, ring the notification bell. You guys know what to do. 
Conversely, if you check us out on YouTube all the time and you want to be sure not to miss any of the other audio only content from the comic source, just go to wherever you get your podcast and subscribe to the comic source. So that's going to do it. We appreciate you listening as always, and we'll talk to you next time. Catch you guys later. Thank <laughs> you.